Well, hello! Hello, hello! Welcome to part two of the 24 hours of amazing marketing ideas. My name is Ian Anson Gray. Welcome. It's great to have you here watching either the recording in the future. You might not think you're from the future, but you are, or you could be watching us live. Either way, you are in for a treat. And I know that the first session was amazing. Thank you so much, Yuri, for being an amazing host to the start of this 24-hour live stream. And I'm going to be live. I'm going to be your host for approximately the next two and a half hours-ish. And this is from, what time is it now? Uh, anyway, until, uh, let's, I can't even work it out. So it's, it's till 11, 11.30, is that right? I think it is. Yes, until 11.30 a.m. Eastern. I'm juggling with my my time, my time zones, but it's great to be here. And this is all really to talk about a very exciting thing today, which is that the most amazing marketing book ever is out. We need, we almost need another round of applause, but I'm not going to play that now. Uh, the Kindle book is out, but also the paperback version is out. If you scan that QR code, you can find that out you can go to Amazon and you can buy it and we'd love you to do that because this is the most amazing marketing book ever be partly because mm. it comprises 36 different authors we've got most of them on this 24-hour live stream it has been put together by our good friend Mark Schaefer who has been amazing and in this in this live in the next two and a half hours I'm going to be interviewing five of those authors. So do scan that QR code. Now, if you can't stay for the whole 24 hours, uh, don't worry, because we've got you covered. You can go to the Instant Replay Hub. So again, scan that QR code and you can uh, you can be first in line to get all those recordings once we are done. So do scan that. Awesome. I think that's probably everything that I need to talk about. But uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be hosting this session where you're going to meet uh, some authors who are ready to share their expertise and wisdom. Uh, I've talked about the, the QR codes and the Amazon. Oh, and by the way, the Kindle is Kindle edition of the book. Let me just put that back up again. Uh, is got a, a crazy reduced price at the moment. If you click on that. If you scan that QR code or go to Amazon and search for the most amazing marketing book ever, it's only $2.99. $2.99. How good is that? So that is awesome. Well, it is time to introduce my first guest of the day, who is the fantastic Zach Seibert, who authored chapter 27 of the book, which is called The Secret Power of Word of Mouth Marketing, which I'm really interested to talk to Zach about because I've always been a massive fan of, of word of mouth marketing. Zach is a government marketing and communications professional who knows how to get critical messages seen and heard. Well, I think it's time to bring in Zach onto the show. How are you doing, Zach? Very good, Ian. Nice to see you. It's bright and early here in, in Utah. I saw you uh, with the the time zones. I struggle myself, so you're you're in good company. Oh well, thank you. That that makes me feel better because it is it is hard because you're that's mountain time, isn't it? Correct. Yep. So yep. we're seven. I think we're seven hours apart. I'm in the UK, Utah. So, but this is one of the exciting things about doing this uh, 24 hour live stream because we're all in we're all over the place, aren't we? Totally agree. Yep. And that was one of the very cool things about this project, too, is the authors being dispersed globally throughout uh, the US and abroad. Yeah. I mean, yourself in the UK, we got uh, Frank from Ireland and others from yeah. Australia, Fiona. Great project to be involved in. Excited to chat with you. Absolutely. Well, if you have just joined us, welcome. Do get involved in the chat. I can see that Anna is here, Anna Bravington, who was on the show earlier. Um, so do let us, let us know. And Cami is saying... And it is already labeled a number one new release in advertising. Wow. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? Uh, Anna also says, word of mouth marketing is so important. Let others sing your praises. Much more impactful than doing it yourself. And I don't know whether this is a British thing, but I I, I agree with that. I, I, tooting my own horn, blowing my own trumpet. Hmm. It's, it doesn't always come naturally. So, Zach. I couldn't uh, agree more. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So it's not, a, not just a British thing. 
<laughs> what I'd love to, I'd love to know a bit more of the background. What what inspired you to contribute to this book? Uh, and you know, just to just to remind people, this is a pretty unique book because it it's not just got you know Mark Schaefer. Obviously, a lot of people know uh, his his name is on the cover, but there's actually thirty six co authors in this, which is exciting. And you're one of them. So what what inspired you to contribute to the most amazing marketing book ever? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think it was back in September of last year of 2022, where Mark in the Discord, the community Discord just said, hey, let's let's get together. Let's have a meeting and let's talk about this project idea that we've been talking about. And there on that meeting, he proposed, let's do let's write a book together. Um, not everybody has the resources or the time investment or the the know how to put a book together, but I think it's pretty easy for everybody to contribute at least a chapter on a subject matter. And so from there, we got the ball rolling. And I remember him sending out um, a sign up form that you could kind of fill out different areas, uh, subject matters or channels or mediums that we wanted to have in the book. Um, and I just remember I myself, I think of myself as a marketer that can can do a little bit of everything, but I'm not a subject matter in one particular thing. And so as I saw the the, the different subjects fly off the shelf, if you will, people were grabbing live streaming such as yourself or podcasting or Mark was assigning subject matter experts to different things. I got a little bit more nervous as I kind of like saw my name shift a little bit or move down in the, the totem pole. But I was relieved when it landed on word of mouth marketing because much as yourself, I love word of mouth marketing. It, ever since I read Malcolm Gladwell's book on the tipping point and uh, Jay Bear's book, uh, Talk Triggers, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Mm. And another great opportunity we had recently in the Rise community was to meet the, the, the father of modern word of mouth marketing, which is Ed Keller. That was a fantastic um, opportunity there. So I've had a lot of experience in in learning about word of mouth marketing and uh, was super excited to contribute a little chapter on such a vital medium that maybe businesses, especially entrepreneurs, don't necessarily pay attention to or know much about. Oh, absolutely. And your chapter is fantastic. It's 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 a real encouragement, but I got lots from it, lots of ideas. Uh, and yeah, I, as I said, I think sometimes we can think in marketing that we we have to do all the hard sell. We have to get on the phone. We have to do all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we've got, you know, we've got these existing customers who hopefully love our stuff, love what we do. So why not utilize them? So tell us a little bit. I mean, obviously don't tell us everything, Zach, about the <laughs> chapter. Um, but maybe you could give us a, like a brief overview, uh, you know, maybe the, some of the key takeaways from the chapter. For sure. Um, so th the main task that Mark Schaefer gave us when writing our chapters was to obviously have our target audience in mind, who is the entrepreneur, small business, uh, small to medium business owner. And I tried to do that uh, throughout my whole chapter. Um, like I mentioned earlier, maybe word of mouth. Pe everybody knows that word of mouth exists, but they don't know how to get it to be in their favor. Um, and I felt like I, I gave some good tips in the book. Um, I, I mentioned that word of mouth has been around literally forever. I mean, you think of humans back in the day living in, in ancient, uh, ancient times. They, they had butchers or bread makers or whoever that they went to. And people in the community would talk to them, um, each other and say, oh, you know what? So-and-so's bread is actually really good. You should go check out this bakery. And so word of mouth has been around forever and it's going to exist forever. It's going to be the channels and the ways that the information is passed along from person to person. That's what's going to change. Um, I've tuned in earlier for the first segment of this uh, live stream and AI was talked about a lot. Um, the metaverse was talked about a lot. How does word of mouth marketing fit into those? How does word of mouth marketing fit into experiential marketing? And I think it's a, uh, I, f I felt like I tried to touch at least to some point, all the main channels and how you could get word of mouth to work in your favor in the chapter. So really excited to see what the, what people think of it and what they learn and uh, how they can get word of mouth to work for them and their business. Well, definitely. And if you've got any questions for Zach, do pop, pop them in the comments. Don't make them too complicated though, because you don't want to put uh, Zach on the spot. <laughs> but uh <laughs> Uh, although he's a professional, so uh, yeah, it's um, got some loads of good comments coming through. So what was your, we'll come back to, I'd love to ask you some more questions 
about sure. word of mouth marketing and and I was really interested with what you talked about AI and how that relates to it. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your experience of of actually contributing this chapter to the book and the, the overall experience. Because have have you ever? Because I I admit I definitely wanted to. I've always wanted to write a book, but I was scared by how much work it was. So first of all, have you wanted to write a book in the past? And what was your experience in collaborating in this project? That, yeah, great question. I am a horrible writer. Um, <laughs> I I feel like I would enjoy writing more if I had a constant uh, editor by my side at all times. And arguably, AI could, could fill that void. Um, but I enjoy speaking more, much more than I do writing. Um, so this was a, a challenge at times for me, but it was really eye-opening to see the process from start to finish, from the very generation of the, the idea all the way through to now publication and promotion and all this great stuff that we've been involved with in the whole project um, as a whole. Um, the one thing that I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm such a young marketer. I've only been in the marketing space for about five years. And I would argue that maybe that is a, I don't know, a strength, a pro, a con maybe. Um, but it was interesting to see, uh, I, I just felt like I need to get my 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 name out there, and this was a great way. So when Mark offered this opportunity, I said, hands down, I got to be on there. I don't care what topic it is, as long as it's not Snapchat. I have no experience with Snapchat <laughs> <laughs> or TikTok, but um, I, I just got to be part of this. And so I kind of wedged myself in there and tried to make myself uh, a value to the group, to the project. And uh, I feel like everybody has done such an amazing job. I mean, yourself included, everybody else that's going to be on this uh, live stream today or has been already. It's been a real group effort and it's honestly been super eye-opening. And I hope everybody that uh, will give it an opportunity to, to give it a chance and read it and um, tell us their thoughts. I'm, I'd be interested to see what they think of the project. I mean, this the book is is amazing it, it is i know the title's amazing but it, but it is and obviously you'd, you'd, you'd think that well of course i'm gonna have to say that aren't i because i'm on the stream right. and i'm part of it but no seriously i mean i've read i've not read all of it but I'm, I'm going through it as quickly as i can and it is just i've learned so much and i've been uh just really encouraged but i um i learned so much from everyone's approach marketing is such a a broad subject but everyone sure. in here has kind of put their own um take on different aspects of it you know and, and obviously your your take is on the word of mouth side of things um we'll talk a little bit maybe i'd like to talk to you a little bit about ai as well uh, fiona says here uh, F uh humans love a good gossip and chat this is really interesting how ai fits in uh, without giving too much detail about your chapter, I'd love to hear your take on how AI maybe hinders or helps. I mean, what does it do? Does it change anything when it comes to word of mouth marketing? Yeah, so I don't touch on this very much in the chapter, but since writing it, I've been thinking about it quite a bit because um, I feel like since turning in our rough drafts, the accelerated pace of adoption and uh, creation of AI platforms and tools has just been out of this world, a, a rocket. Um, so that being said, I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I feel like AI is going to cause, and you could quote me on this. <laughs> I feel like it's going to, I feel like it's going to cause a, a word of mouth marketing renaissance for lack of a better term. I feel like, this renaissance is going to happen because of two things that people are hungry for experiences. People are hungry for personalization and number two, or I guess three rather people, there's a lack of trust um, with deep fakes with AI and the, I mean, chat GPT or Bard being notorious currently for giving maybe false information or partial truths. And what does that mean for, for marketers? I think it means that, People trust people. People from the beginning of history have always asked other people's opinions, whether it's in the physical world or the digital world where I always go to the reviews first. I say, okay, I want this product. It looks good to me. What are other people saying? And even though I don't know Joe Smith on Amazon who left a review on a vacuum, his opinion matters to me because he experienced the product and I want to know if it's a product that fits my needs. Um, 
so I think that AI is going along with other things. I think it's going to bring about a word of mouth marketing renaissance. It's people are companies are going to have to focus more on the trust, more on the experiences, and uh, providing those to their customers. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be brought to the forefront uh, um, here in the near future. That's fascinating. I, th- I think you're so right because, you know, as as Fiona says here, she says. Uh, trust is a major issue in today's society uh, and it's you know I, like you i mean I, i'm excited about ai and how it can help mm-hmm. in so many ways but i'm just thinking about thousands of uh, ai powered amazon reviews things like that yeah. And, yeah. and that's a bit scary you know so so trust is going to be even more important and vital so um I just thought, I'd, yeah, I just thought I'd ask you about that uh, because I think that's really sure. interesting. So going back to what you said before about, so you were saying about um, how you came to write the chapter and it kind of <laughs> fell upon you to write the chapter on on uh, on on, uh, on on the subject that we're talking about. But, but um, and you said something you said something really interesting to me that you've only been. I think these were your words. You've only been. In, in the marketing space for about five years. I, I just, as a side note, I wonder whether it's a bit like that for all of us because marketing's changing so often. I mean, I feel like I've been in the marketing space for two minutes sometimes. <laughs> it's so true. It, it feels like that. What What has been though, in that time that you've been a marketer, what has been your most impactful experience in, in the marketing field? and and how has it shaped your approach? You know, how, I suppose it's the kind of how did you get to here today? What what's what's been the influence for you? Yeah. Um, so I I was fortunate enough to to go to the university or to college um, and a degree in digital marketing. That was a thing when I went to school. So we were one of the first universities, at least here in the states, that offered it um, a digital marketing degree. It's just a four year bachelor's degree, but I. I have always loved um, art and I've always loved people. And I felt like melding the creativity and people together, it just marketing made sense. So that's kind of how I started on my marketing path. As for where I am today, um, honestly, I owe it out to be one little message that I sent to Mark, coincidentally. <laughs> so I remember I was getting ready to graduate from college and I was trying to polish up my LinkedIn profile. And I was looking at profiles of, of people that I admired or people that I wanted to be like, and Mark Schaefer was one of them. And so I was looking at his profile and reading his bio, and obviously it was amazing. It was stellar, <laughs> polished. But I noticed there was one little, um, there was one misspelled word. And I was like, oh man, I wonder if Mark knows about that. And so I, I had been following Mark obviously silently for probably years and I reached out to him in a LinkedIn direct message and I just said, Hey Mark, um, my name is Zach, you know, introduce myself. I'm graduating and was looking over profiles that are, um, I th- in my opinion, really great on LinkedIn because I'm going to start applying for jobs. And I sent him a message saying, Hey, there's one misspelled word in your bio. It's this. And he messaged back. He said, thank you so much. What's your email? And he sent me rise coins. I, I, you were involved with the Rise community when there yeah. was the, the the tokens, right? The coins. And that was what started me on this whole journey. I mean, looking back now and all the changes that have happened to not only my personal life and my career, um, but also within the community, it's been a wild ride. And I think we've we've had some ups and downs. But today, honestly, is like the the climax, the, the high of being involved in this project, working with you, Ian, working with everybody else involved in this live stream with Mark. It's, it's amazing. It, just it, a little it, tiny message on LinkedIn. And it, and it happened to bring this. Yeah. <laughs> it is amazing. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have shied away from messaging people like mm-hmm. the, the, the big, the big names, you know, the people who are, have made a big impact on me. And, and that's was the case with Mark for me as well, that, you know, I, I remember seeing him at, at a conference in Wales in the UK uh, many years ago, and I was just blown away. Um, but I was also blown away at how approachable and how, like, he wanted to help me yeah. and help. And I think that's what we've all felt, I think, as part of this, uh, the Rise community in writing this book, that together and through Mark's teaching, but also 
through encouraging and and uh, through our own expertise, because we've all got lots of different areas. It's been an amazing experience. Um, this whole this whole project. I love Anna the, says Anna's yeah. great. She's says because I think <laughs> let's be honest. That we're honesty corner here. Anna says, "Don't worry, Zach. And I'm a writer and still found my chapter difficult." And, so true. Uh, it, it's yeah because I don't know about you. I I I probably was overthinking it. And this is a book. It has to be amazing. But we had. I mean, sometimes we have to trust in our own expertise. I think, but also. We had um, pretty amazing proofreaders and editors and, and all that kind of stuff. So that always is good. For sure. Very fortunate. And I mean, imposter syndrome is real. Um, people can argue it all day, but um, it's real. And sometimes it's it's hard to overcome. But with a, a community that rallies behind you and encourages you, I feel like it makes it at least a little bit easier. So that was that oh, was absolutely. helpful. Absolutely. I think I think all I think most of us struggle struggle with that. But I, I found that the Rise community has it's given me much more encouragement. And I think, so this is one of the questions I, I was going to ask you next, which is how do you adapt your marketing strategies to stay ahead in this rapidly changing landscape? I mean, things change so rapidly. I think, I think for me, part of that is being in a community like Rise because uh, I, I think I got exhausted by trying to keep up with everything. Um, how do you How do you deal with that? How do you, because... Because you, obviously you you are a marketer, you have to you have to stay ahead. How do you do that? Yeah, I I am saddened that I don't remember which of my professors taught me this, but he said, "Remember your ABCs, Zach. Always be curious. Always be curious." And I feel like that's ringing more important today than ever as the the rapid adoption of technology, AI, the metaverse, NFTs, Web three, you name it. It just it's accelerating at a more rapid pace now than ever. Um, I think it's important to be curious, to try new things, to uh, there's the other quote that is uh, there's no comfort in the growth zone, but no growth in the comfort zone. So you got to mm. step out past your your comfort zone. And that's where true growth happens as an individual, as a marketer, as a professional. Um, and I think that if we take that step, uh, that blind leap of faith, if you will, I think we'll be rewarded. And whether it's a learning experience or maybe a slap on the wrist for trying something new, you're, you're still coming out better than you were before. And I think it's keeping that mindset that's important, um, trying new tools as they come out, but maybe not uh, putting all your eggs in one basket is another another phrase that's used a lot. Um, yeah. Those would be my tips and advice to, today to any new marketers or people looking to, to progress. And I don't, I don't think that's just for new marketers i think that's for us all i mean i i think that, that there were loads of golden nuggets in that and i i want to go back and replay what you just said because i think that is so so powerful and so important for all of us to re, to remember what to stay curious and what excites us what is interesting and, and i have to say i went through a period relatively recently of just being a little bit i don't know what was would be the word you know maybe overwhelmed or just feeling a little bit Nuh, about marketing and mm -hmm. i realized what it was is i wasn't being curious i wasn't spending the time looking at the things that interested me uh yeah. and since then i've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole with ai but but that's sometimes i i look back at my career and it's those times when i the, the successes that i had was when i was curious so i yeah. totally agree with you Awesome. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, AI uh, to that point too, I feel like AI can be a point that brings many marketers down just because, especially the creative, more the creative side or content, just because they, they feel like they're replaceable now. But uh, again, that human touch, um, it carries with it so much trust, so much hum like humanity is so important. Everything we do, uh, content marketing, um, and anything we do. So I think that it's important to realize that, uh, always be curious. Like we just talked about to, to try things out, to be, a, try to be ahead of the game. Uh, that's, it's hard to stay afloat when you feel like you're drowning, <laughs> yes. but, uh, do what you can a little by dedicate, a, I don't know, half an hour each day to experimenting or going outside of your comfort zone, trying, trying something new, jump on chat GPT, jump on mid journey, jump on, um, on discord a new platform try things out i think that that it'll you'll reap the benefits of it absolutely i think as as 
when we stop being kids and we become adults, we can sometimes forget that curiosity. And I think that little bit of, you know, those, that inner kid, we sometimes need to unleash it again. And yeah. I, I think ChatGBT can actually, it's helped me become more creative. Like I'm a kind of, I'm a, I, I like a bit of web development and, and coding a little bit. I'm not like a, a big, big way, but, <laughs> But I've found ChatGPT has allowed me to create new cool things, you know, with a bit of help. So sometimes you can, it doesn't get in the way. It doesn't replace you. It's not replacing me. It's just giving me ideas. And I think that's, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Looking at it as, a, as AI is your augmenter, it kind of enhances yes. your abilities. Yeah. Yeah. I, love I like that. that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, go back to Cami was saying, uh, I think talking to Anna, but Mark sent my chapter back to me. So there we go. <laughs> so we're, we're all being honest here, but this is this is why. Uh, and Frank is saying, brilliant. Bless you sent that message. It's been great to getting to know you in the Rise community, Zach. You too, Ian. Would love to hear the backstory of you joining Rise 2. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure I'll be showing that another time. Um, <laughs> uh, and we've also got Katie Simpson watching from the UK. Hi, guys. This live stream 24 hours is amazing uh and dan who is up next so i can actually see yes. him in in the waiting room and waving at him <laughs> <laughs> it's coming on soon but curiosity is the thing or the thing I agree with ian chat gpt has helped me cultivate curiosity um but great. we've got to let it yes absolutely um yeah so um just the final just before we we finish uh I'd love to ask you, as you're moving forwards, we talk, we've talked about curiosity. Uh, and maybe curiosity is a skill, it's a tool that we should use. What, what other essential skills do you think that we need to succeed at the moment? Uh, we've got curiosity, which is great, but surely we need a few other things as well. Tell us what they might be. Yeah, I think, and I've, I've trying to devote a little bit more time personally to this is networking, mm. whether it be digitally, whether it be in person, I think networking is so important. Um, I love the rise community for that purpose because there's people all around the world and they're all subject matter experts or are in this one niche area of business, which is marketing. And we're all experimenting and learning and growing together all the while I'm growing my network. I now know, I know Frank, I know yourself, I know Fiona, I know so many great people within the Rise community that if I'm in a pinch or have a question, a really tough marketing question, I can send a, a direct message to them on, on Discord and know that I'll get a response within a day or two, depending on time zones. <laughs> but uh, I think that that's super important. And then um, I think, pardon me, what was the question one more time? Well, it was it was just one of the essential skills that, oh, as right. well as as uh, the curiosity that we need to have as marketers today. Yeah, yeah, I think, like I said, the the networking, the the curiosity, and then I, th I think it's just experimenting too. That's all marketing yeah. is yeah. is a one big ex constant experiment. Test one thing, reiterate, test it again. Uh, whether it's email marketing subject lines, whether it's uh, content on a platform, whether it's live streaming like this, try things out. I mean, the worst that can happen is that nobody says anything or maybe they say <laughs> one rude thing, but that's okay. People are people. Exactly. People are people. <laughs> well, thanks, Zach. We are out of time. It's going so quickly. Your chapter in the Portion. book is chapter 27, The Secret Power of Word of Mouth Marketing, which is awesome. And you can buy the book now. You can buy it from Amazon. It's out on Kindle. And it is also out as a paper book, a book book. So scan that QR code. And we'd love uh, we'd love to, you to experience it and to just to find out a little bit more about uh, about it all. Thank you so For much, sure. Zach. It's been great to have you. and great. Thank to you, Ian. Great chat. host. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Looking you. forward to checking everybody else out. Thank you. Definitely. See you soon. See awesome. Well, we are we are kind of zapping through the uh, twenty four hour live stream. We are here interviewing all the different authors. If you've just joined, welcome. Uh, this is a twenty four hour live stream, uh, sharing so many marketing tips with you. You can also buy the book on Amazon, the amazing, most amazing marketing book ever. Um, it's by Mark Schaefer, but co written 
by 36 authors and we're going to be interviewing most of them over this 24 hour period which is very exciting so do scan that qr code and we'd also love to hear from you this is not a one-way communication machine i can already see we've got some fantastic uh got some fantastic comments here we've got uh katie is asking what is the rise community well it's a community um organized and hosted by mark Schaefer. you definitely need to check it out uh it's on discord um maybe cami if you're watching you could post a link to that in the comments or frank or somebody who's already in the community that would be awesome frank also was saying before uh yes experiment do more that works as well and sandy who is on very shortly says it's a community of people from around the world all interested in learning constantly about marketing that Mark Schaefer, marketing author, speaker and author launched. That's a much better job than I did, Sandy. Thank you very much for that. Well, just uh, another reminder about the book. Do scan that. But it is time to bring in my next guest, an author. Uh, and who is it? It is Dan. Dan, Daniel Nessel. Can't wait to speak to Dan, uh, who is, well, before I tell you who he is, his chapter is chapter 26, Strategic Communications. Trust can be your competitive advantage, which is very exciting. Can't wait to speak to Dan about this. Daniel Nessel is an award-winning corporate communications and marketing innovator, leads communications in North America for a Japanese manufacturing and retail company, a true believer in guess what the word is curiosity and the power of conversation dan hosts a bi-weekly podcast the dan nestle show let's bring in dan onto the show dan welcome Ooh, my heart is beating so fast thank you ian <laughs> it's so great to be here my first ever uh live stream actually and all is this it? time i can't believe i've never done a live stream before i feel I feel like a couple of years of podcasting and just being in, in the communities have, have prepared me for exactly this moment. Well, you just seem, you seem like so natural and calm. Like this, uh, what's your secret? <laughs> drugs, man. <laughs> but actually the secret is, is that it's you and it's, it's Fiona and it's all the amazing people who've put this together and, and, and helped us to really understand what to expect and, and rehearse us through some of the technology. Um, it's, it's just been an amazing experience from beginning to end. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about the book and all that, but I want to give a shout out to everybody who's maybe been, uh, who has not, not maybe, who's definitely been part of the vast infrastructure of people, um, w which is a small but mighty uh, army, I suppose, of people who have just made this thing just truly the most amazing marketing book experience ever. It's, it's just fantastic. And thank you, Ian. You're yeah. just a terrific host. I've been watching and Oh, I'm looking forward you. to this conversation. But I mean, I think that, that is so true that the, the community, because we've all done, started to do things that we've not done before. You know, this is your first live stream. Uh, that, yeah. I don't know whether you've written any books before, but that was, nope. that was certainly my book experience, first book experience. Is that the same for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've always fancied myself a writer. It's like you think about, um, have you ever seen The Unforgiven, my favorite movie of all time, 1992, I think, uh, Clint Eastwood movie. A Western, and if you're not familiar with it, there's a there's a writer that tags along with one of the one of the uh, uh, and I guess one of the minor characters, uh, English Bob, and the writer I think's named Mr. Beauchamp or something. Anyway, um, every time he talks, he talks, he introduces himself as a writer, and it's like the Wild West. Nobody's seen a writer before. He says, you know, I'm a writer, and everybody says, what letters and such, and he's like, no, no, books, books. So I feel like up until this moment, I've been that that letters and such guy. You know, I've I've written. I've, we write all the time in our life. We write yeah. whatever blog posts I write for my, my show. I write for, uh, for my, for my work and being a corporate communicator and a corporate marketer. I've written tons and tons for work, but I've never, uh, had the opportunity to write something like this, uh, to be part of a book. And, and I think Zach was talking about this, about how Mark kind of made it, uh, very accessible to, for everybody who necessarily hasn't necessarily written a book before to become an author. And, and, you know, I'm so I mean, I'm so humbled and, and of course, proud that as of yesterday, I'm like a published author. I can't believe it. I'm looking at, <laughs> at, uh, at, public, at now I can put that in my profile. It's pretty amazing. It's a funny combination. It's kind of funny. You said, you know, humbled and proud, but I think that's true because it is, it's like 
we've had to go through quite this learning experience and, and realizing for sure. I don't know about it for you, but at least for me, I've, I've realized how much goes into this. And in that sense, yeah. I have been humbled because, oh my goodness, there's so much to do. But we yeah. have the community of people, yet today is a very exciting experience. We're all obviously very proud of the book being launched. Um, so it, it is a real combination of, of the two. So tell us, how, how did you um, get involved with contributing to the book? What, what inspired you and, and how, how, tell us a little bit about the backstory. Well, funny story. Um, I was one of the kind of OGs in the Rise community, I suppose. Like, so after Mark, Mark or Schaefer, obviously we've been talking about Mark a lot and, um, and he's the, 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 uh, marquee author of the book, of course. Um, Mark runs a, an, an incredible, um, kind of think tank and I call it think tank in the woods. It's a, it's an mm. unconference about, about 30 people every year called the uprising mm. and a couple, not this past one, but in uprising 2022, um, we learned how important it was to get involved with web three, how important it was to, uh, to kind of explore this idea of community and, you know, um, yada, 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 the, uh, the rise community was launched shortly thereafter. Um, and you know, as, as one of the first folks in the community, we just looked around and saw these amazing people that Mark was curating to be part of this community. And, um, I opened my mouth one day, said, uh, Mark, maybe we should do a book. And, um, it's and your fault. <laughs> it's, it is, it is, it is my fault. Um, I'm a really good starter of things, not necessarily a great finisher as, as I'm sure Mark will attest to. Um, but you know, we, we talked about it for a while and Mark wanted to make this a, a real collaborative effort from the get go. Um, and just, it took shape with, in a collaborative way. So like, just by saying, let's do a book. I didn't, I didn't have the vision for what the book would look like necessarily that, that then came with, with further conversations. Um, and, um, you know, he just, at first it was like, well, let's do a book. And then I, it, then it was like, well, you know, Mark had, obviously he's one of the most busy speakers around. He said, I just don't have a lot of time necessarily to devote to to editing. So I'm going to need a lot of people. I said, I'll, I'll raise my hand as an editor, but I have a day job. So I need some other people. So I just reached out to a few other folks in the community, Brian Piper, Joanne Taylor, and the three of us became the frontline editors for the whole, for the whole thing. Um, so I, you know, helped start kick off the book. I then volunteered as an editor. So, and I love editing by the way. So I, I, I loved editing about a third of the authors, which was fantastic. And then, you know, I wrote the chapter on strategic communications because, you know, I, I, I'm the only real kind of PR slash comms person um, in, who's currently practicing mostly PR and communications um, in the community, uh, or at least in, in the in the very active part of the community. So, um, so I thought that that needed to be uh, an important topic. I think it is an important topic that marketers and all of us really need to be aware of. Uh, so anyway, I, that was all the inspiration for, for getting into the project, for writing the book, you know, it's sort of like, it's like a lot of other projects I've done. It's like, I get the ball rolling and then I just sort of run into it and get going. I don't know what I'm into. Um, and then I count on the, the, I guess the, the amazing quality of the people that I'm associated with to, uh, to just work it through together. And I definitely was not disappointed this time around. And, you know, uh, like, like many other things. You know, I may have opened the, opened the door, but so many, so many great, amazing people actually, uh, you know, blazed the path from from which that yeah. door led. So it was just, it was just, just terrific. Totally agree. I, it's been, and people have really stood up to the the tasks put before them. Uh, it's been amazing to see everyone's expertise. I mean, I don't think I would be that good at editing so i'm glad you were there with a few others um, yeah it was fun so um that's been great let's have a look at some of the comments just before sure. i want to ask you about your chapter in spe right specifically uh, anna bravington is saying uh because you, you use the word curiosity a lot i love mm -hmm. curiosity i'm incredibly nosy i love investigating investigating and everything and john Esperian is awesome he says bought the book earlier today nice one ian mark and everyone thank you john Thank you, John. Uh, Fiona says, and buy the book. Yes, please. <laughs> please buy the book. Please, please buy the book. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, marketing leaders saying, so impressed. Apparently that is Kareen, I think. Um, and Mark Schaefer is here. Great to see you. Hey, Mark. Mark, love, go, Dan. Absolutely. Thanks, yes. Mark. Yeah, this was originally 
your idea. <laughs> there uh, you have so it. That, so there you I go. Did, I didn't make it up. <laughs> <You did. laughs> and um, yeah, Anna's saying this is so good hearing everyone's voices and seeing all the voices. I, I think that's so true because I, I mean, I've, I really love the community. Um, but it's not often that we kind of get together face to face like this. And I know we haven't had a kind of face to face chat, Dan. So I'm really enjoying True. getting to know you a bit more. And, and so tell us, um, without giving it all away, obviously, sure. give us a brief overview of the, the key takeaways from your chapter. Um, you know, tell us what it's, sure. what it's about and, and a little bit more. So the chapter is strategic communications and how trust can be your competitive advantage. Uh, there's a, a serious lack of trust in the world in case you haven't noticed uh, around us. Uh, and I, you know, in my experience with marketing communications, marketers tend to focus a little more on the transaction than on the person, right? And um, over time, I think that's changing a lot. Uh, but you, it's, it's important to keep in mind that, that there are ways that you can build trust with your audiences, with your stakeholders, as, as, as we prefer to call them, um, that will eventually you know, lead to better relationships, uh, you know, uh, build um, affinities and ultimately lead to hopefully you growing your business uh, and growing your reputation. So, you know, it's in the realm of communications, which includes PR, uh, public relations, in, you know, investor relations, government, all the R's, all the relations uh, parts of our of our external and internal um, communications apparati, apparatus um, that um, that you know are responsible for getting that kind of message out there and building uh, trust uh, among a wider variety of stakeholders that influence your business and that and that hopefully will will also work into your uh, your marketing or sales process and funnel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so the, the key things. I mean, I, I I I presented what I thought were ten ideas that any marketer could run with um, and think about as you develop your own or any you know any entrepreneur marketer even even for po folks in my profession in PR and working for corporations you know 10 things just to keep in mind as you plan as you move forward and as you build a reputation in the market and you know your reputation some people say it's synonymous with brand um, it is it might as well be you know your reputation is everything if you if you have a bad reputation you have a bad brand uh, period uh, and there's no question about it so you know I provide 10 ideas or 10 ways that you can build that reputation in the book. Um, and, um, you know, things like, you know, think about stakeholders instead of audiences. I mentioned that earlier, you know, um, you have a variety of people and it's not just somebody you're preaching to. These are people who have a stake in what you do as well. So, so it's a, it's yeah. a two way street, you know, um, think about your employees and the people that you work with as a major one, of those stakeholder groups, um, all about conversation instead of conversion. It's what we're doing here. It's, it's, you know, Brooks Ellis has said it a lot better than I have. I'm sure Zach probably talked about it before here and many people will during the course of these couple of this day, um, those conversations establish an emotional connection, which then become uh, trust, build into trust. And those are the folks who will go to bat for you and advocate for you and your brand um, as you can, can conduct business. So much, so much more, of course, I, I, I urge everybody to, to buy the book and find out. Um, but it's a, you know, if you, if you, if you check out the book, skip straight to, to chapter 26 and 20 minutes, 15 minutes or so. And on a slow read, you'll be able to, uh, to absorb a lot of information about, about, um, strategic communications. Well, this, this is a, it's a topic that I don't, well, I, yeah, I would say I don't know that much about. It's not something that I've invested the time into sure. in the past, I, I really should have. And I learned so much from the chapter. And thank you. I think it's, it's that different way of thinking. So often we can focus on, as you said, on the conversions on, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not to say that we shouldn't be looking at the analytics and stuff. But do you think that is part of the problem here that, that a lot of these things like conversions and sales, I mean, they're all very measurable, whereas what yeah. you're talking about, some people might say, well, that's a little bit, how do you measure that? Yeah. What would you say to them? Well, first of all, you know, when you, when you're starting to measure, you know, measurement is, is critical to any, mm -hmm. any part of our business, to anything that we do. And, uh, I think that, uh, the PR and communications world, um, yeah, skip to thanks Mark, but the PR and communications world is, uh, is yeah, just, just, um, 
Mark is correct. Skip to personal branding. That is the best chapter. Uh, however, that said, uh, personal branding is also is also a reputation building exercise, right? And that needs to be measured. And you know, measurement is is key to all of this. So, you know, the thing about PR and communications is it's it hasn't had the benefit of of kind of understanding how to measure that for many many years, and it's behind marketing in that way. Like so so what we what we think of as traditional marketing or as, as even digital marketing digital marketing is brilliant because it is extremely measurable at every moment and and the things the levers that you pull you can see the the reactions pr communications is getting there um and i think that that we're pulling some levers we're 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 changing attitudes and minds it's the question is the measurement is more delayed it's usually it takes it takes a while to to see the effect of what you're doing because your reputation is a cumulative process, um, uh, and you know you can do spot surveys and do measurement. You can uh, you can watch behaviors uh, using in, using any number of social listening tools. Um, you can you know you can see what co your, what people are directly saying through comments and etc. And you can just get a pulse for for your employees. There's there's a lot of ways to measure what you're doing, um, and then you know more and more uh, as 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 PR communications marketing sort of blend. Um, it's really about how you measure content performance and mm -hmm. the what you put out there into the marketplace or onto the channels that you're that you're focused on or in front of your audiences. And uh, you measure the same way that you would with marketing. You're measuring, you know, what's important to your organization, whatever ladders up to the goals that your organization has. You know, in some in some cases it might just be awareness. So you're looking at engagement metrics. In some cases. You really want to see, you know, how you, you want to get a little further into the intent stage and you want to see if people are reading your, you know, your white papers or what have you. So, so I think it's more and more measurable as time goes on. I don't know if I've actually yeah. over answered the question, but that's. No, no I love that. Yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. really good stuff and uh, a fantastic answer. So you need to read the book. I can see we've, we've had a few people scanning the QR code, you know, with the technology, we're talking about measurements. It's amazing. I can see how many people have. So we need more. We need more of that. I'm going to put it on the screen. <laughs> uh, you need to have a look at the Kindle book, the most amazing marketing <laughs> book ever. And do, do um, keep commenting. It's great to see people all around the world. We're going on for quite a few more hours into the mm. little hours of the morning in the UK. Um, wherever you are in the world, there will be, we'll still be yeah. going. Um, and let's have a look at the chat. Um, so Sandy is saying it is about conversation, not conversion. Yes. Um, abso absolutely love that. So yep. I'm yeah. going to ask you the question that I asked uh, Zach before, which is sure. it's kind of the how did you get to where you are today kind of mm. question, which is like what has been your most significant learning experience when it comes to this? Um, how, how have you got to where you are today? So, I mean, anybody who knows me uh, would know that that's a question that I might be able to fill up my entire three hour spot separately <laughs> with. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to I'll, I'll try to, to keep it kind of to, to the point, um, there, there's no one thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of different things. Um, but I will say that um, this last year, in particular, the last two years in particular have been just, uh, you know, you're, you're, you, you reach a certain velocity and then you don't think, you know, you kind of think that your career or your, 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 your knowledge or your understandings on a particular track and then something happens and it su just surprises the hell out of you and you end up kind of absorbing more and learning more and going in all new different directions. And, um, like I, I had a, I had a career. I still have, I mean, I still have a career. Um, I went, I came up through, you know, marketing and then communications, you know, I've been in marketing and communications for you know 20 years, but I, I think, you know, I have that, that work experience and, and I got a degree in marketing and, and, you know, all that stuff, you know, check the boxes. Um, so, you know, in, in many ways, it's kind of standard The, the I guess the non-standard parts would be that I did a lot of that in Japan and in Asia and then moved back to America, I guess, 13 years ago. But um, so I, I did I did always have a kind of worldly approach to things mm -hmm. and, and try to get a lot of different perspectives. But, you know, I, th I think what really got me going where I am now is 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 meeting the right people. Um, giving of, of my time, but also just sort of absorbing others what, what, what's going on and, and um, you know, uh, finally just getting brave enough to get out of my own way and 
put myself out there. And when I started to do that, the world changed. Um, mm. our, our very own Mark Schaefer is one of the people responsible for that, for sure. Uh, and, been an incredible mentor, tough love sometimes, and a good coach, but also a good friend. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we've become friends over the last, uh, certainly over the last year. Uh, but, you know, you get nudges from people who have your best interests at heart, and you know that they have your best interests at heart. And that, I think that is where, you know, what, what got me really where, it's, where I am. So in practical terms, you know, if I felt like I needed to create something, so I created something, you know, I started my, my show. It's, I, I, I started to meet more people. I got more and more information flowing into my head. Um, in the comms world, I was able to bring that into my job. That differentiated me from pretty much everybody else in my field or most people in my field. Um, not always in a good way. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it was all about, um, you know, that's your, 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 you're getting over your skis, Dan, or your, your stay in your lane type of conversations that have, that, that have happened in the past. And, and I do, I do like to to try to push the envelope with innovation, um, but you know I've been really fortunate, especially the last few years, to be working with people who are like, okay, let's cultivate that. Let's 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 dig more into AI. Let's dig into three um, D uh, uh, Web three. Let's let's kind of see where we can go with um, you know bringing the marketing discipline more and more into public relations and communications. So it's like, you know, I, I've just been very fortunate to have have been in an environment and in, in companies and with now the Rise community that have really, I think, put, put a rocket on my back for this kind of, you know, personal and professional development. I'm not sure if I got to the answer of your question. You but did. No, you did. And I, <laughs> you I like what you said, a rocket on, the, on your back. Because I, yeah. I, think, I think I've been thinking about this a lot recently that... We, we all need encouragement, I think. It's so A lot of us don't get the encouragement sometimes. Yeah. But we also need people to tell us the truth as well when, when we, we mess things up or we're not on the right path. And sometimes that can be hard, but we need people that we can trust to do that. And I, f I do feel with the Rise community that we, we have that. And certainly I felt that with Mark. He, um, he's encouraged me, but he's sometimes told me things that maybe I don't want to hear, but I probably no. need to. Uh, Say it isn't so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, Mark is saying, oh, thank you, Mark. Say you're a star, Dan, and you ah, too, Ian. There thanks, Mark. Thank yeah. you. And um, we've got uh, Jenna. Hurtful. Oh, Jenna. Jenna saying, hi, Dan. Wonderful seeing hey, you live. It's I'm great to see you. For thanks for tuning I've in. learned from you. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. My former colleague, she's fantastic. Ah, awesome. Texas. So I was yeah. going to ask you. So you you've you spent some part of your time in in Japan, mm -hmm. and what I find interesting about well, one of the many things I find fantastic about this book is that it we're not all from the same country. We authors are from all around the world. And yeah. So it's some books are quite U.S. centric or U.K. centric. This is a little bit more global. How has your experience in working in um, in other countries helped you here? I, it just gives you. I think it just gives me a different, a different perspective. Sometimes a weird one, um, for sure. Uh, if, if you go back to curiosity, you know, um, sometimes because I lived abroad for a lot of my uh, formative adult years, from twenty, from age twenty-one or so to thirty-seven, I suppose I was in Japan for sixteen years, and that's a really important time as a, in professional development. And then, then you, know, you get encultured and you get kind of used to where you are. Um, then moving into, uh, into, I went to Australia for a year, and and uh, that's a whole different conversation. Then I moved to to back to the to the states, and through those times, like I carried the Japanese sort of hierarchical way of thinking and deferential way of thinking with me, and I had to get that sort of knocked out of me a lot. But but what it has done is it's it's given me this kind of every time some like I I take pause when I hear things that don't exactly there's whenever I feel dissonance which happens a lot, I just I have to pause and I have to ask why. So why, why is that? Why is that? And I think it's that why, the curiosity that, you know, it, 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 at certain times it may have delayed me a little bit, but I think over time it's sort of compounded on itself and the, the answers I'm getting are now really bearing fruit. So mm -hmm. that it, it, we, see, we keep this, this theme is happening a lot, curiosity, curiosity. I can't stress enough how important it is just keep asking why. And I think that's what living abroad really helped me do is, is, you know, you don't, you come back, 
you, you go back to where you're from perhaps and it's no longer obvious why things are the way they are. You, you now have different frameworks, different mindsets to apply to the situation that you're in and therefore more capability, I think, hmm. to, to exercise your curiosity. And you know, if you don't do that, I think, I think it's, it's almost criminal, uh, it's almost negligence uh, that, that you're not exercising that curiosity. But I think that's really, um, that's an important part of it all is, is it just sort of you know, gives you a lot broader of perspective. I think that's, that's, that's a really interesting answer. And it, it kind of, it's a little bit like, so I think asking those questions, why? Quite often we get like a, a typical parent's answer response, yeah. which is just because. <laughs> yeah. And we need to push and push back against that. Like for me, you know, I, I'm in the live video streaming space and, you know, I would never want to say you need to live, you need to, you know, somebody says to me, well, why should you live stream? A really bad answer would be just because, you know, why? You know, actually asking the question, the opposite question, why? What would happen if I didn't, you know, is, is yeah. quite a good way. So I'm putting it the opposite way. We're almost out of time, Dan. Uh, so wow. I just want to ask you a uh, final sure. question. What has been your experience in writing the chapter and, and being involved with this book? It, it's all your fault, Dan, so we blame yeah. you. But like, how, how how has the idea, um, how did that change, your, your kind of expectations change throughout the whole process? How has it all been for you? I, I, so, so it's been a, it's been a real journey. I, I, it's never been a, it's never been on the, a bad one. Like it's been just mm. constantly a, a, a journey of constant amazement. That's why I think the most amazing marketing book ever is a really apt title. You know, the information that's in the book is apt to, ch to change. It will. Things are, our, our industry is just, is, well, you know, recently, especially with, with what we're seeing with, um, with AI, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but, um, but it needs to be. It needs to be understood that we have amazing people, and uh, and and this whole process has been a learning one. And uh, you know, so from the from the beginning, um, I I was really pleased to be involved. Um, I dug in, and I and I really kind of worked very diligently over like my breaks and and um, and days off, I suppose, and over the holidays. But it was a joy. It was a really it was a labor of love, and um, and it just kept getting more interesting to me seeing the way people are writing you know given the chance to write a 1500 word chapter in a in a format that i could really deal with was fun it was it was it was a fun and difficult exercise because you know writing anything to a deadline always gives me a lot of agita but <laughs> but i so there was that but then the whole editing process and seeing what everybody else went through um how how many great writers we have um it's just been it's just been a, a, a joy. I mean, uh, and I'm learning every time I open a, a different file on my well, now the book, uh, you know, I, I a different chapter, you learn some you learn a couple of new things, you, you, you write them down in it for future reference. Um, I, I have I fully expect that every paperback copy of this book that's issued is going to be just loaded with post its and, and dog ears. And, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. when I think about that, that's, that's really what, what it, that's what it's about. You know, that's why I think this is ama This really is amazing, and and um, it's surreal. I, I still can't believe that. Oh, sh as of yesterday, I'm I'm actually a published author. This is crazy, um, and and thank you, Mark. But I I am, you know, I I think this is just the beginning, um, and you know the way that we are integrating this this world of experiences into the book. It's not just the book. It's the community. It's not just the community. It's the live stream and our extended network. It's not just the extended network. It's our families. It's everybody. Like so, it is really becoming uh, much bigger than than you know just thirty five people deciding to you know to write about something they like to write about. And um, that is just it's just amazing to see. Oh, so I love couldn't it. couldn't agree with you more. That is a, a, an amazing place to end. Uh, yeah. The community is is definitely everything. Uh, and just a few comments before I let you go. Uh, Kami is saying, I can attest to the tough <laughs> love. I'm grateful to Mark. She Kami, is, shout out to Kami. My oh, gosh. Yes, everything, absolutely. like the whole, the whole promotional process for this book and everything you see online, all the, you know, all the, the, the marketing that we're doing for the marketing book is, she is, she's a genius. Thank you, Kami. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and Fiona as well, who's been helping oh. me with the, the live stream. Kami yep. and Fiona. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, in a WhatsApp group with, with, there's three of us, you know, mm -hmm. behind the scenes admin stuff. 
and they while I was asleep, they're just pinging each other and, and just oh. this that that I just I'm in total awe of them. Absolutely. Uh, Gary is saying, uh, "Great work, Dan. Thank oh, you, Gary. <laughs> Gary. Gary is Gary is one of my one of my friends and colleagues from Japan, oh. um, and um, I'm so glad to see folks from all over the world now joining us us here on, on it the is. live stream. It's it's cool to see. And Fiona is saying, "Blame Dan." Frank <laughs> is saying, "Yeah, fair play, Dan, for kicking it all off." Uh, Frank, the design. Look at that yes. fantastic design, Frank. Um, and so much, so much more. We can't even begin to begin to talk Absolutely. about what Frank has well, done. We, we could go. So, yes, yeah, Sandy's saying, so glad you kicked this off this book. Well, uh, so just a reminder of the chapter that Dan wrote is chapter 26, Strategic Communications Trust Can Be Your Competitive Advantage. Indeed. And you can also get the book. Scan the QR code. I can see two more people have scanned the QR code, which is awesome. Yay. So buy the book. It's either a book book or a Kindle book at the moment. So do check that out. Yeah. Um, Kindle book is incredibly inexpensive too. I mean, it's it, what, oh yes, like three dollars. Thank you for the reminder. It's like yeah. I did have this written down. How much? Two ninety nine US. I That's think. That's it. I'm glad yeah. you know because I have got it written down somewhere, but I can't find it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so much to do but yeah thank you dan it's been great to have you on the show my um, pleasure ian this has been fantastic i'm so glad that we were able to connect this way i um, um and i'm coming back on at th three this after 3 p.m eastern folks to be uh to be a host for a couple hours so please come join the line screen yeah, yeah. For, i'd forgotten that yeah so you're you're gonna be in the hot seat so that's yeah. gonna be cool <laughs> yeah thank awesome. you thanks dan i'll put you back into the green room you got thank it you. thanks everybody thanks. bye Awesome. Well, time is just going up, going so quickly. I'm going to have a quick sip of my tea because it's a thirsty work, all this very, very exciting stuff. Uh, I'm going to bring in my next guest shortly, but just a reminder, if you want to, if you, obviously you're probably not going to be able to stay up for the whole 24 hours, uh, but uh, you can sign up for the Instant Replay Hub so you can get all the recordings. And you can also sign up just to get some more information about the book. So that's the QR code there. So do check that out. And I'll also give you the QR code again for uh, Amazon. And of course, you can just search for the most amazing marketing book ever. Um, but um, just, just do a search for that. Or you could scan this QR code here. So uh, do check that out. And it would be great, um, great to, to have you, to, for you to buy it basically. So do keep the comments coming. Uh, I can see Fiona is saying, uh, let's just put that down there. Mark is a brilliant leader. Uh, it's so blessed. And f also saying, uh, awesome team, Ian, your rock coming is amazing. The whole Rise community is legendary. Awesome. Right. Well, it is time to bring in my next guest who's been very patient waiting in the green room. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, and Sandy wrote the chapter, chapter 25 on how to make promotional products sing. And as a professional classical singer, I don't do much professional work anymore, but I did train as a professional classical singer. I like the word sing in there. I'm not going to do any singing, don't worry. Uh, but uh, Sandy Rodriguez wrote chapter 25. She is a, pro uh, let's get the words right, a promotional marketing consultant and owner of the owner of D&S Designs. She is also the founder and business advisor of Sandy Solves and leads CEO Council's high-level masterminds for successful women founders. Let's bring Sandy onto the show. How are you doing, Sandy? Hey, Ian. I'm doing great. This has been so much fun to watch so far. It's been amazing. It's uh, just the idea. I don't know who came up with the idea of the 24-hour live stream, but... It's quite it's quite an ambitious thing, but so far it's gone well. So <laughs> it's been great fun. Where are you, where are you dialing in from? Um, I'm in the greater Philadelphia area in the U.S. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. Now, just a, a reminder of the chapter that you wrote in this book. It's chapter twenty five, how to make promotional products sing. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with this book and and, and this particular topic as well. Can you give us a bit of a, a background on that? Sure. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. 
So I got into the Rise community because I've been following Mark Schaefer for quite some time. And he put out that uh, recommendation of if you haven't been an author yet, you can participate in this book. And he listed all kinds of topics for the book, but none from where I was coming from, which is the world of promotional products. And we actually emailed back and forth a little bit about that, about, well, you know, I don't know if that fits in the book. And I'm like, well, promotional products have been around for at least a hundred years. They're not going anywhere. We definitely need a chapter in the book for that. So I had to pitch <laughs> to get into the book. So my story was a little different, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's an important part of what people need to do in their marketing. It's not all digital. Yes, it's funny that, isn't it? I think we are so logged in to the digital world that we forget there's a whole world out there. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'm not I'm not denying the importance of technologies like Web3 and the metaverse and stuff, but right. there's, there's, there's the real world out there. So tell us a bit more about why, you, as well as focusing on all the exciting in people's minds, all the kind of new shiny tools thing, what, why should we be focusing on what you're talking about here? Promotional products are one of the longest lasting marketing mediums you can use. If they're chosen properly, I mean, I'll just grab, for instance, a pen that's sitting on my desk. This pen with all its marketing is in front of me and has been in front of me for at least six months to a year. I mean, until the ink runs out, I'll be seeing that marketing <laughs> message. Um, radio ads, TV ads, anything digital comes and goes, comes and goes. So you need the repetition um, and the constant effort to be out there creating content, uh, more podcasts, more videos. Promotional products, if you put the right things in people's hands, they can last. I've got one that's lasted decades. And that is one of the best investments that you can do with your marketing dollars is something that's going to hang around for a long mm -hmm. time and keep your brand top of mind. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? If we're going to market, it's so that we have that brand awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love that. I love that. Um, it, it's something, and I, and I think this is the... It just reminds me, I, I have this problem that I tend to, I probably have shiny object syndrome. But I tend to think about all this other stuff. And there's, what you're talking about is so, so powerful. So you need to buy the book and find out all about what Sandy is talking about. Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit more, maybe to give us a few little tips um, from from the book that you shared in the book. I don't want you to give it all away there, of course. Right. Um, but, um, oh dear, some people like Frank is saying, I need to sing, do some singing. No, I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Invisible Warriors says, hey, Sandy, you look great today. You're going to rock it. And uh, Dan, Dan is saying, hey, thanks so much for the conversation. That's awesome, doing some live streaming. And my friend Katie Simpson is here saying, hi, Ian. Hi, Sandy. The book sounds great. Do check it out. Katie. So if you've got any questions, any any questions for Sandy, any uh, any comments, do get involved. We'd love to hear from you. This is not just us talking. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, Sandy, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, maybe just give us a kind of a, a brief overview of, of the, the takeaways from your chapter. Yeah, I'll hit a couple of the high points of the 10 things. Um, the reason some people don't get good results with promotional products is they just go to the web and they buy things. They don't give any consideration to how that fits into the overall marketing of the business. Um, and people are like, well, I spent this money. I can't measure the results. Well, yes, you can. If you choose wisely and carefully, you absolutely can measure the effectiveness of the dollar spent on your promos. So a lot of people were just like, oh, okay, I got to go cheap. I don't have a big budget for this. Well, my favorite analogy to that is, okay, let's say you come to me and you want that 15 cent pen. What are people going to see when they're throwing that cheap pen into the trash? <laughs> well, the last thing they see is your logo. And what does that say about your reputation when you <laughs> your stuff is going into the trash, right? It's not a good representation of who you are. So, you know, budget is only one consideration of the 10 that I suggest. I mean, there are Another one is the purpose. What do you want them to do? What, what mm -hmm. is your hope? Do you want people to just be aware of your brand? Do you want them to sign up for your event? Do you want them to buy more of your stuff? What are you trying to accomplish? Not every product will get the same kind of results. 
Um, and it's why those of us in the promo industry are very fond of saying you need to work with a distributor because we know the answers to all those questions and we can help you target and choose better with your products. Um, another thing that gets neglected in the use of promotional products, even in a good marketing campaign, is the call to action. What do you want them to do after they receive that product? Yeah. Right? And sometimes you can have that right on the product. Sometimes it can be part of what else is going on, but it is one of the main considerations um, as you're making your choice for what you should do. My favorite clients are the ones who come to me and say, um, like, just it just happened this month. One said, we need a plaque for this guy who's retiring from an event he's been running for decades. And I emailed her back immediately and said, does it have to be a plaque? <laughs> I so I hate to sell things that just collect dust. Can't we do something more fun? And I loved her reply. She was saying, she said back, I hoped you would say that. <laughs> she knew, she knew I would give her something much more interesting to work with because she has worked with me in the past. And sure enough, I gave her this idea. It's one, actually one of my favorite awards right now. It's just a cube, but it's metal. And you can put these attachments on it. It can just be words, a stock attachment that says thank you or you rock or awesome. Um, what I'm doing right now has a little square that magnetizes onto the cube that has a little stick and a clip on the top. So you could put a note in there or a picture or something. So yes, two sides of this are going to be full color printed, uh, recognizing this man and the work he's been doing. But it's also fun and practical. Who's not going to fidget with it? You know, it's like oh, a... That's great. It's a fidget toy and an award all in one. And plus you get that little special, let me clip my family picture at the top of it. So for the same amount of money they would have spent for a lovely plaque that would get hung on a wall and never looked at, now there's something he's going to put on his desk and he's going to play with and be proud to have. Um, and that's just one example of, I, I go way outside the box when people come to me. <laughs> I love that. That's, I mean, that's just, you've, you've really got me thinking, you know, and I, I a few years ago I was looking at getting some merch uh, for my channel. I, I was looking at some, some t-shirts and maybe mugs and things like that. Right. And I had I've I've had some stuff sent to me, um, some mugs and t-shirts. And the ones that are really memorable are the ones that are really good quality. I've got so many mugs that have just died a death. You know, the 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 design is coming off. They look horrible, and they just go in the bin. And as you say, you know, that's the not a good it's not a good look if you the last time you see the logo is as it goes into the into the trash. So the, the other kind of question I wanted to ask you is because I love the idea, you know, th that a client of yours came to you with the idea of getting a, a plaque done. And he said, does it have to be that? And you came up with these other ideas. How do you come up with all these ideas? Mm. How do you stay on top of it? Is it just the that you're a very creative person? Um, or how, how do you kind of stay on top of that? And because I think a lot of people would be worried that they would just stay still and not and just be, choose the safe option. Oh, that's a good description, Ian. Too many people do choose the safe option. Yeah. Um, I would say it, it was so interesting. For so many years of my life, I would have never described myself as creative. Couldn't paint. Couldn't draw. Okay on uh, the piano, but you know not. Not what I look at everyone else and go, oh, you're so talented. You're so creative. I have no creativity until I start to play in my sandbox. And that's where my creativity starts to come out. But, you know, I can't take 100 percent credit for it. It's also knowing the right suppliers who have more innovative ideas and researching them when I get a project mm -hmm. like this. And then, of course, the more I do that, the more I get a background of, oh, this is cool. I mean, like another idea I presented her was a Galileo thermometer. If you've never seen those, you'll have to Google that because it's a really fascinating thermometer and I can have it laser engraved with branding. Wow. Um, it's, it's fun. I mean, playing in the promo world is absolutely fun. There's so many cool products out there and I get so frustrated when people say, yeah, I got t-shirts, pens, and mugs. No offense to you, but that's the first place all our brains go. There's a yeah. world of products out there that people don't even know exists and I love bringing those to the table and getting these wows. I just did a wooden snake puzzle for a corporate who had bring your child to work day. And mm. I had to have something that would work from like third grade to 12th grade. Now that's a wild yeah. range of ages to come up with one product that would make them all happy. <laughs> 
but you know, it's not, it's, it's in the general area of like a Rubik's cube. It's a, that kind of puzzle. You can twist it into different shapes, but it's wooden and it would work for all of those ages. So that was one of the ideas I suggested to them. I didn't actually expect them to go for it, but they did. So oh, I'm going to get back to them and see how the kids felt about it once they got yeah. it. We'll fidget with that forever now. I mean, isn't marketing awesome? Because yeah, okay, it, it's it's it can be quite mathematical and statistical, but on the other hand, it's hugely creative and yeah. it's fun and. Again, you know, you've reminded us of, it seems the word of today is curiosity. You know, it's, it's going, you, you know, without your curiosity, you wouldn't have gone and found suppliers and, and that, that are thinking out of the box. You wouldn't have, you, you'd probably be playing the safe card as well. Um, we've got some comments so yes. um, and question. questions as well. So, uh, Frank is saying, Sandy pointed out, we should have cards and stickers related to the book. There you go. Awesome. There we go. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. I love that. And the thrill of getting those in the post really reminded me of the power of a physical object. Yes. In an ever, ever increasingly digital world. And I think that's true because one of the things I, so I totally agree with you, like the, that my idea of t-shirts and, and mugs was boring uh, because I didn't have you. I didn't know you, you see, I need, I needed your creativity. But one thing I did think about is to with that to have a postcard with a with a QR code and to try and encourage people to take selfies and things like that. But but it is this, I think it's the physicality of maybe receiving a handwritten letter or, or something physical in the in the mail is is so powerful. Um Cami is asking the qu a question here. So how can you mix promotional products and your digital footprint. I love that. She's even put a little emoji there. Um, yeah, that's a so great, great, great question. question. What would yeah. you say to Kami? So there are a number of ways to do it. First of all, there are digital promos that can be branded now. And I expect to see that growing um, as we get into a more digital lifestyle. We're just getting used to it. So that's one way. Another way, um, years ago, QR codes came out. Everybody went crazy and used them, but nobody had any real intention behind why to use them. So they died out. Recently, they are returning. And it's a tool I've been using very intentionally with a lot of my clients. Um, one example is a bandana I did. Bandanas are great because they've got huge imprint areas. And we put a QR code on the bandana oh, cool. to drive traffic to their website. Another time I did a QR code for um, a gas company that was recruiting students for internships so that would take them right to the um, application form, right from the QR code. They could scan it right from their phone. So that's just a couple of ways that you can integrate the two. Great. Love that. And Zach says, I love how promotional products can be uh, customer touch points, which can lead to word of mouth. Oh, that's good. Like that, Zach. So we're tying back into the I word of know, mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Bang, to see what's happening here. It's all great. Um, Alpi is saying, is, are you seeing companies pulling back on promotional mer merchandise spending at the moment, given rising costs? That's an interesting question. It is, and it's an important one. And I'm glad he asked it because this is a point I wanted to bring up. Um, one of the things that happens in a down economy or challenging economy is that people pull back on their spending on marketing. Mm. But it's very important to remember that the companies that survive those times are the ones that stay visible. Yeah. This is not the time to stop spending on promos, although some companies are doing that. So that is true. But the ones that stay visible are the ones who will survive to the end of the challenging time. I mean, it's all cyclical. It'll come back. The economy will recover from this. And so the ones who are making a very diligent effort to stay visible, to stay top of mind, are the ones who are going to do better through this. And promotional products is one of the best ways to do that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And you could argue that because there are so, some companies that are not investing in marketing, that maybe it is a, a better, a good time to, to, to do that if, if, you've got, if you've got the budget. Uh, you Absolutely. Can it. Yeah. Especially, again, I can't emphasize this point enough. It has to be well thought out and part yeah. of a marketing plan. It can't be a random, oh my gosh, we got to go buy pens with our name on it. <laughs> it, it. It can't be that panicked kind of buy. I've seen it. I mean, I've been at this for 30 years, so <laughs> I've seen a lot of wacky things done. It needs to be, that's where I come in, right? And other distributors were like, okay, what are you trying to achieve here? 
you're trying to stay stop, top of mind. Where are your pe people? One of my examples from the book is a pizza place, right? Who wants to stay top of mind? Well, where are people when they need to be thinking about your pizza? Yeah. Generally, they're standing in front of the refrigerator because they're hungry, right? So if your magnet is hanging right there on the refrigerator with your pizza place name on it, people are going to be like, oh, I know, let's buy pizza. And you get yeah. more sales. It's, it's very subtle, but it's having the right, play, right product in the right place at the right time. And that's what I love helping my clients to do is yeah. to use that right product so it will be there. Things that go in the car. You know, I have a inside the, the cup holder, I have a, a coaster. And so that brand is in front of me the entire time. Mm, I, I like that. How about kind of, uh, how to, I don't know how to ask this question. It's It's kind of thinking about your audience or your customers as individuals and almost personalizing it in a certain mm -hmm. way. So to give you an example, I live in Manchester in the UK. It's a pretty much, a, it's, it rains a lot. Let's put it that way. And I was given an umbrella by a brand because they put, took pity on me and they, they saw me, they saw me on social in the rain and they sent me out an umbrella. And I thought that was, I was really touched by that because they'd thought of me and my situation. How much of, I mean, obviously that's, that's difficult to scale. But is that something that um, you can touch upon about, you know, thinking about your audience in different ways? Absolutely. And this goes to the broader marketing concepts anyway, right, is knowing who your users are. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, a lot of distributors niche into certain spaces, and I'm no different than that. I like working with corporations. Um, I get more of a free hand to make suggestions and Put more interesting products on the table for them to consider giving um but that's also because i'm i know who their intended audience yeah. is like if it's going to their employees or if it's going to go to their um their customers so everything that we do we try to target that way um i was somewhere i was going with that <laughs> <laughs> ask me the question again i'm sorry no it's okay it's so it was it's it's about the i suppose it's like the personalization it's thinking it. about the the right. individual situations and, and producing uh so our industry that, yeah, yeah. yeah has adapted to that actually it's because we live in a more personalized world mm -hmm. and a lot of suppliers will actually go so far as to individualize the items so one of the, uh, the natural gas company that i work with for example they did uh the stainless steel tumblers and mm. each one of those that I did had each individual's name on it. Cool. So that's, I mean, you can't get more personal than that. And there are more and more companies now that the technology exists offering that it's more expensive, as you might imagine running one offs of things costs a lot more money, but it is growing in that we are able to hand people things that are, are completely customized. In fact, as far as that goes, I've seen where you can design your own apparel now. You can create your own shirt and they'll make that. So it's really becoming very, very customized to what individuals want. It's fascinating to watch. That's fast. That is fascinating. Really interesting. Um, Dan is saying swag is so effective uh, for employee um, activation too. So yes. definitely. And Fiona says uh, promo products can really get the UGC going. So Tell me, tell us a little bit more about your experience with contributing to this book and being part of this community. You told us a little bit about the background of how you, you got involved. Um, but how was, you know, when you started, what was your kind of view of this project uh, and your involvement? And how has that changed uh, towards today, which is the big exciting day of, uh, of the launch? So tell us a little bit more about that transition. Uh, it's been such an amazing journey. And I've heard this from other authors too. So I know I'm not alone in this where I really have had a lifelong goal to write books. And I've got a lot of books in me. I just haven't been writing them. <laughs> yeah. So when Mark said you could write a chapter, I thought, great, I can handle a chapter. <laughs> so I really enjoyed that. I turned it in um, rather quickly. And in hindsight, after reading over the proofs later, was like, oh, you know, I would have edited this so much. The perfectionist in me showed up, you know, and I was like, this, this would be better if I had done it this way or that way. Why'd I turn it in so fast? I was <laughs> kidding myself. 
but it was done. And I am a recovering perfectionist. So I said, done is better than perfect. I let it go. Um, and then Mark said, okay, now it's time to read your chapter. And I went, uh, why well, have to read this now? Oh boy. So I found a closet to read it in to get all the sound things right. And I sounded like a robot because I was speaking so precisely. <laughs> like, okay, that's not good. So I tried it again and it was terrible. I think it took me four takes before I got one I would send in to Mark to even consider. It was much harder reading my chapter than it was writing it. And I never guessed that that would be the case. Yeah, interesting. So um, being part of this community, oh my goodness, it has been so amazing meeting all, meeting you, meeting all the fellow authors in our different events, knowing I'm going to get to meet some of you in person in just a few short weeks at a book launch party. Um, it, it's incredible to just be part of that and know that, you know, as soon as I ask a question, we have a network now of all of us who will support each other. It's very incredible. I got to give a shout out to John Asperian publicly too, because he's part of the reason I ended up in Mark's group in the first place. I think he might've mentioned it was the Rise community in his um, posts, but the two of them are very tightly tied and I'm very appreciative that that happened so that I could get into Mark's community and be a part of this. I mean, it's so exciting. It is. It, it's been it's been amazing, and uh, thank you so much for your contribution. It's been, and and it is it is the community because uh, that support, that encouragement, um, but also today doing this live stream, it's just great to. We've it's funny we've we've all been kind of chatting away in Discord, but um, actually seeing each other face to face, having a proper conversation, is is awesome. So uh, thank yeah. you, thank you, Sandy, for for that. Um, just before I let you go, uh, for people who are just getting started in the world of marketing, have you got any tips on on how they should get started? Obviously, they should just buy the book. That's that's the the main thing that they should do. Right. Other than that, what would you recommend that they do? Um, I would say, and I've actually been mentoring a young man who's coming in to the digital communications part of marketing you you can never stop learning. Mm. Find people like Mark Schaefer, find experts in your particular space, because I mean, marketing is so huge, obviously. I mean, we've cut all these chapters on it. Find the experts in your space, follow them, learn from them, read their books, read more books, take classes. I mean, it's funny because I haven't mentioned this, but my background is not in marketing. I started my career as a teacher. <laughs> I taught fourth grade for six years and then I stayed home and raised a family and homeschooled. And so to find myself in marketing now was kind of a surprise. I didn't aim to go there. <laughs> um, so it, it also goes to show though that you can get the education you need and particularly today, thanks to the internet and books, you can learn what you need to know to do um, what it takes to become a marketer just by committing to learning. So I guess that would be my biggest tip. And don't stop. Oh, my word. I, uh, <laughs> we've heard it said a couple times today. A lot of what we have written has already changed that fast because the world of marketing is just yeah. evolving at light speed. It, it is. And I, I, I thank you for sharing a little bit, bit of your background because I think often we can think that we need a, a set kind of path so it might be a marketing degree. I know we've had a, a few authors today who've had marketing degrees and that's great. And there's a lot of positives from that. So I'm not taking away from that. But equally, you can have another type of background. Um, you know, as a teacher, it might be like like yourself or, you know, I, I taught and, and sang as well uh, professionally before I went into marketing. And I think sometimes we've also mentioned imposter syndrome. Sometimes we can think mm. that we need a certain kind of background in order to be successful in what we do. And that's not, that's not true um, at all. I'm sure you would agree. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's been great to chat with you. Um, uh, a reminder of your chapter. Let me get it up on the screen. So chapter 25, how to make promotional products sing. I love this. I haven't got to your chapter yet. I, I'm really excited about reading about this because I have dabbled in this world 
and I have been boring. So no longer. <laughs> and uh, Well, you know I'm here if you got questions. <laughs> well, there you go, exactly. And of course, you can buy the book. It is out on Kindle today at a super proportional price of $2.99, or it'll be equivalent depending on where you are in the world. That QR code should take you to the Amazon closest to you, but you can also search for the uh, the most amazing marketing book ever in there. I can see we've had a few more scans of the QR code, but it would be good to have, see a few more in there as well. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's been great to great to have you on the show. Um, Thank you. It's been yeah, a pleasure. It's been great. I will put you back into the green room. And yes, uh, if you have just joined, welcome to 24 hours of amazing marketing ideas. As you can see on the screen, we are celebrating the launch of the most amazing marketing book ever. It is a collaborative book uh, with Mark Schaefer at the helm and his Rise community. There's 36 authors. I've contributed a chapter on live streaming and we're interviewing all the authors or as many as the authors as we can in uh, this 24 hour period. Um, I'm, I, I think I've got two more authors. So we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting, this is very exciting. I can see we've got Yuri waiting in the background. Um, so I will, uh, I will bring him in shortly, but um, do, do check out the QR code there. I'm just going to da, 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 do that. And let's see. We, yes, so we have Yuri next. And I had the privilege of being on. Uh, so Yuri was uh, hosting earlier. He did an amazing job. And I've also uh, spoken to Yuri before in the metaverse, which is like I had, I'd, I'd heard of the metaverse. I thought, mm, I'm not so sure about this metaverse thing. And then I got the opportunity to be in the Rise Community Metaverse and to actually speak in there. What an amazing privilege. I learned lo loads from this guy, Yuri. He's um, just a, an expert in the realms of Web3, NFTs and all that kind of stuff. Well, his chapter, chapter 31 of the book is how to use Web3 NFTs and tokens for your marketing. And I think this is a very kind of new, exciting part of marketing. I think something that we all really need to know about. And Yuri does an amazing job of giving us some tips, explaining it all in the book. And Yuri is, Yuri Belast is a fractional CMO and Web3 marketing strategist. He is a best-selling author on Amazon and the host of the CMO Stories podcast, which is all about Web3 marketing. And Yuri loves public speaking, which is awesome. Well, I'm going to bring in Yuri now onto the show. Hello, Yuri, how are you doing? Hi, Ian. Nice to be back again. And, it is. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm all these days excited. I thought I will do some other stuff, but I was not able to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. We're, we're, we're kind of, yeah, we're, we're tempting you away from the, your, your other work. But anyway, this it's not every day we get to publish a book. Um, but I think Am I right in saying you you've you're already um you're already an author? Have you done books before? Yes, as you said in the introduction, mm. I published one book which was around social media marketing, which was three weeks on number one on Amazon. And cool. that was actually at the moment that I was I had decided to go for Web3. So it is a strange story. But uh Ah, okay. So you so you made this so yes. And um, but that is the problem, isn't it, in in marketing when we pivot you know and i've pivoted a few times you know you become known for one thing and then you th see the temptation is just to stick with that uh when you actually should be focusing on something else so uh, this isn't one of on my list of questions for you but i am really interested in this like how did you make that switch from from that to to web3 and focusing on in this because basically like i can't every every time i go like on linkedin or, or somewhere and i want to know about web3 I see your face. <laughs> so you're obviously doing a great job. T tell us how it happened. Yeah. So actually, Mark, you know, Mark Schaefer, who we both know, he's the, the the father, I would say, of the rice community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's played a big role in that. So in a nutshell, let's, let's say about, you know, it was March 2022. I was in San Diego at Social Media Marketing World. I had bought a token. Of Mark's coins, eh? the rally token at that moment. So I go to meet Mark in person 
there in San Diego. At the same event, Michael Stelzer, so the, the organizer of Social Media Marketing World, gave an NFT to everyone. Mm. And so I was talking to Mark and he was talking about, you know, Web3 and this Discord community, or, or he was even thinking about, you know, doing it on Slack at that moment. So I got to know Mark, I, I get got an NFT for Michael Stelz, and I said, why do they as an organization that is really known for social media start to do stuff in the Web3 world? Mm -hmm. So I dove into that. I met Mark, I connected with Mark, I was one of the first members on Discord. And then in the summer, I followed Mark Schaefer's branding personal branding class. And you know, out of that, I would say six sessions came out that I needed to focus on Web3. And so I, I have been diving into Web3, making content about that, having my podcast, as, as you mentioned, and repurposing this podcast, putting it everywhere on social media. And so people got to know me for Web3. The, the funny thing about this story is at that moment, my book, which was an, an adventure of three years, it didn't do well in Belgium. So I'm in Belgium, people, you know, for one or another reason, it didn't work. I took my book to Social Media Marketing World in 2022. People in the US were excited. I said, okay, let's put it on Amazon. Let's have a few people buy it at the start. And yeah, it's a strange story, but at the moment that my book was on the top, on you know, on the top, I decided to do something else. <laughs> but it's it's great you had that experience in in writing a book and obviously that didn't put you off in getting involved with this project. So you how did you know what inspired you to contribute to this book in particular on web3? Well, actually for me it was a no brainer. So I had a, I had already written a book but it it took me 3 years, you know, to get the things that were in my head on paper, because I'm, I'm, I, for me, it's easier to talk, to speak mm. than to write. So first you need to get your thoughts on paper, then you need to promote it. And so that's a whole adventure, but then being in a community where you have people that take on certain, I would say, responsibilities, have certain skills, you have the shared accountability, of course, you have someone like Mark Schaefer who has already established a brand, which who has already written best sales in marketing. So for me, it was like all these things together, I just need to do this. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm really happy also because in the adventure itself, you get to know all the other authors. And that's been amazing. I, I mean, that's probably been my most, the fun thing about this. I mean, writing the, writing the chapter was, was fun. And I think I got a lot of confidence from from writing it because I realized actually how, I don't know whether you ever feel like this, but sometimes I forget how much I know. And I wrote it, and I thought, oh, I actually do know quite a lot about this. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes we need a reminder of that. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by Web3 and, and all of this stuff, you know, and, uh, but it is it is quite a, a complex world. There's a lot of people. I, I talk to my kids, talk to my wife, talk about to uh, my friends about NFTs. I try and explain it to them. Um, try and talk about crypto. It's it's there are a lot of difficult concepts. Um, so I wonder whether you could give us a brief overview of the of the key takeaways in your chapter. Um, and I'd love to know how do you go about demystifying and, and making these concepts easy for us to understand? So first thing to making it easy to understand is avoiding those complex words, like for instance, NFTs, instead of uh, talking about NFTs, we could say digital collectibles. Instead of talking about the metaverse, we could say virtual worlds. So instead of talking about Web3, you could say a new version of the internet. And then, because that's a question Ian, I get all the time. Uh, and even from experienced marketers, I was at the mastermind um, in Anaheim a couple of months ago, and I was asking advice, how can I you know, grow my mastermind for uh, to find Web3 people? And they said, what is Web3? So that was the first question. So then I was at the table, I did the table talks. I also did the table talks, Web3 table talks at Social Media Marketing World this year. First question, what is Web3? So then my answer is, 
I compare with Web1. Web1 is when the internet started. People were consuming information on the internet, were reading stuff on the internet. It was one way. Hmm. Then Web2 came with social media. You were putting stuff on the internet too. So it was reading, writing, so both direction. The problem now that we see with Web2 is that all these big companies like Facebook, they own your data and you don't own the data. So Web3 solves that problem. And so, okay, it's, it's, it's really short, but it's in, in, in but this kinds of, I would say of, of comparisons of trying to avoid difficult words that people start to get it and by, you know, and you can also learn it by listening to podcasts, listening to other people, repeating you the same things again and again. Uh, and one of the words I also like to use for metaverse, it's the immersive, you know, aspect of it that you really feel that you are immersed in mm. this, in this uh, virtual world. Yeah, I think that's that's great. I, lo I love that getting away from the jargon and, and explaining things in a easy to understand way and and being in a community like i love new technology but even i was i was a little bit kind of nervous or put off by the concept of the metaverse i thought i, I kind of mistakenly thought this is just it's not going to go anywhere it's it's i i couldn't I, I think i couldn't understand it or conceptualize it until i actually went in and right. was involved in it um so how how do you how do you teach people who are maybe a bit skeptical about all of this how do you get them excited about it or is that too hard is that a difficult job i don't know no it is not there, there are different aspects around web3 yeah first you know i guess you will have had the same issue like i had so there are imposters on the internet on social yeah. media they just copy your profile you have fake profiles all the way and there is not so much that Meta does about this because they like to have a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of user accounts. So then they can, they are on the stock market or so they can say there are so many user accounts. So the problem is those fake imposters exist. Now with Web3, it is, it is not possible. It's, everything is on the blockchain. You can have a digital identity, which I explain to people. And this digital identity can then be linked to a Web3 domain name. So I explain them these terms and then they start listening. Like for instance, I have the digital identity, Yuri.nft. And I say to people, if you are now first to understand this and to get your digital identity, you will you know, be ahead of the game comparing to everyone else now in this world. So digital identity is one thing I explain to them. Then I explain them NFTs and tokens, how you can see this as a membership as a loyalty card that is on the blockchain and that has a value. Like for instance, um, you can also use this as an access for an event. For instance, if you go to an event to a concert, after that, the ticket is worthless actually normally. Mm -hmm. Instead of you are a collector, you want to you know keep all these tickets. But in, in Web3, you can sell it and the initial owner can still get money if this ticket is resold and resold and resold. So NFTs have their advantage. And then metaverse, as you said, just experience it, see what it could do, how you feel like it. Um, and and then by doing it, by being there, you know, you gave a talk in the metaverse. You would never have imagined that if you wouldn't have <laughs> tried it and see how people would yeah. react on that. So, uh, yeah, so, so those different aspects, I talk about this and people get like fascinated by the story and they want to learn more. I think this is great. You know, I think I have spoken to quite a few people who've maybe been put off by some of these uh people who are explaining it using lots of jargon words. So we've uh, got uh, uh, Larry saying, great point, jargon and buzzwords get in the way more often than not. But it, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated. And the way you explain it is ju it, you just have this great way of explaining it in an easy to understand way. And it is also, there are some really key benefits to this. Th th this is not technology for technologies sake which is exciting and you know being part of the rise community is amazing too because we can discuss all of these things so i'd love to know yuri what can you give us a, a brief overview of the takeaways from the chapter in in your in the book 
which is about Web3. T tell us a little bit. D obviously, don't give us all of it, <laughs> but this is, this is the key takeaway. I know it's exactly the question I also <laughs> asked to my, when I was, I was, yeah, there are some takeaways, of course. Uh, one of them is, you know, just take now the first step and start to explore you know, visit the metaverse, make an account, it's free, just check it out. How can it, how does it work? NFTs, for instance, non-fungible tokens, check maybe around you, maybe there are already some people that you know that have it, that have a wallet, ask them where did they get the NFT and then make sure that you, when you get an NFT, that it's a free NFT at first, so that you can not lose any money, but then you see how it works. I have also NFTs that I have, I have given away to people that filled in a survey, for instance. So if other people like me do that, they give away an NFT as, you know, as a gift because you help them, then you see how it works. So I would say, check out the metaverse, check out an NFT, how can I get an NFT? How does it work? Create a wallet because that's for most people the most difficult part. But there are like now I would call them like between Web 2 and Web 3 websites that give you the opportunity to get an NFT for free or to buy it with your credit card for a few dollars. And then you create directly a wallet address because you need to log in with your email address and you create a wallet address by creating an account. And that's way the onboarding is really easy. And then from there, of course, once you see, okay, this is an NFT, this is how it works. And yeah, you need to, you need to take the first step, I would say. And then once you have this, then you can start to think for your business. How could we use an NFT if, for instance, I have a store, okay, if you store, you have maybe a loyalty program. Or if you organize events, maybe you have tickets or membership passes that you have. So start to think, how can I replace something physical by something digital, which is on the blockchain? And the blockchain is just it's just there because you know it. there cannot be any fraud because it's on the blockchain. So people know it's uh, it, it's the real membership card. If I have an NFT, for instance, in the beginning, we had, an, we had an NFT, a token to get access to the Rise community on Discord. If you didn't have the token, you would not able, be able to get in. So think about in the real world, uh, I would say applications like access, membership cards, loyalty, and then see how, how uh, yeah, you could use NFT for that. No, that's great. That's really helpful. And so all of this is is in in the chapter that you wrote on 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 this on Web three NFTs. Uh, it's not scary at all. It's it's all it's a great way to get started in this world. And I, I, I think I think the way you explain starting off in a, in a simple way, don't just jump into the deep end. I, I think sometimes we can listen to some very advanced podcasts that talk about this and get scared off but it's just a case of starting off. You don't have to necessarily get involved with blockchain at the start. Because I didn't realize actually, Yuri, that you could just buy NFTs using a credit card. Uh, or, or Obviously, you can get free ones as well. So um, I wanted to ask you how... So you, you told us a little bit about um, how you got into Web3, but I'd love to know a little bit about how you... Were it, what what was your significant learning experience? What helped you become an expert in this? Because this is still this is a very still fairly new technology, technology, a very new part of marketing, um, and it feels a bit like the wild west. <laughs> it's kind it, of new. So how is, how did you get started? How how did you get to where you are today? So I had like uh, an advantage of my background. So I had in the past, before I went into marketing, I had a business intelligence company, a consulting company. So I understand IT and tech. Mm -hmm. Also, I had an investment club. So I understand the financial markets and how they evolve. And then I've been into marketing already for quite some time. So for me, marketing and IT and finance come together in Web3. And then when I heard about these concepts, it's easier for me to fast understand everything comparing to, you know, someone that comes from a whole other background. 
So what did I do? So I, I was talking to people. I was starting to invite people on my podcast from the Web3 space. So before that, I was just inviting people a bit from different kinds of you know uh, niches. But then I said, okay, now I just invite people from the Web3 space. And by talking to those people, every time asking the same questions, getting different answers, listening to podcasts myself, being in the network, talking to people, discussing, um, and, and just trying out stuff like, you know, I was in Mark's community and uh, like Dan was the, the guy that said, let's do a book project. Like I was a guy that said, let's do events in the metaverse. And Mark says, yeah, let's do this. So and it's we your, just it's did your it. fault again for the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and I just said, let's do this. And because it was a safe environment to learn. And because of that, those different aspects came together and made me you know, make 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 them on over to really go fast and and really get uh, you know, that people knew me in the space and because I was connecting with them. So now, if you talk to someone, they will say, "Oh, Yuri, yeah, I know him," because I talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so. We've got lots of these people to to blame. But I wonder what the, the next thing is going to be an NFT creation project or something. Uh, Fiona, Fiona says cowboy Yuri. So yes, it is the <laughs> Wild West and. Uh, you make it much easier to understand Yuri and take away the fear. And I think that's true. There is there is an element of, of fear with this. I, I think you've done a really good job of explaining how we can get started with this. Um, I'd love to hear from you some maybe some more ideas on how um, businesses and maybe maybe smaller businesses, because I think, you know, the, the bigger businesses like Nike, we've talked about Nike before. Yeah, who, uh, it's they've probably got bigger budgets. They they've got bigger marketing departments. But can small, medium sized businesses use Web three, the metaverse, NFTs? I'm, I assume the answer is yes. But can you maybe give us some examples on on yeah. how they can use them? Like I mentioned already, the loyalty card or the membership yeah. card. You could do the same thing. You don't call it an NFT. You just call it a digital membership card. If you have, for instance, a small, uh, you know, sports center or fitness center, you could do this instead of like a regular uh, membership card. It could be a digital one. The same thing with someone who sells, uh, you know, as a physical store, who sells, who sells clothes or whatever. That could also be like an NFT. Um, if you have a restaurant and you want to organize events in your restaurant, you want to start up a networking club, for instance, you're an entrepreneur, then you could use the NFT as a membership card and also something that's visible on the blockchain that people are proud to share. And you could uh, use the aspect of scarcity, you know, to, to, to have people want to get the NFT and show them to their friends mm. so that they are proud to show it and, 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 you know, being ahead of the game because now they have an NFT, but it's linked to their favorite, maybe store in the village where they live or, or something else. So, so, Membership, loyalty are, for me, the two things that you could use it. Also, access. Access to, you can, everything that you organize or that you want to gate, uh, you could use an NFT for this. With an NFT, uh, you could see an NFT actually as a badge where you add a kind of logic to it. So if I have your NFT, Ian, you could add a rule like if, then, else, for everyone that got the NFT in their wallet, they have access to special course about live streaming on my website. Mm -hmm. But without the NFT, you don't have the access. If, if OEF is, it could be like a premium layer or something really special that you limited. And because it's li it's really limited, people can see it. Um, it could make sense. So these are uh, one of the options. There, there, there are many options, of course, but just think of not specifically on an NFT, but think of something digital, access, membership, loyalty. And then that's first because it should be useful. Don't have an NFT project just because you want an NFT project. There, have, there has been a time when people just bought every NFT. Of course, if you are an artist, for instance, and you can create art, that could be a possibility that you sell something as an NFT, but then the NFT, again, can also be a proof of ownership that you own that specific mm. art. 
No, that that's really interesting. And I think this is the the problem that still still a lot of people think that NFTs is just digital art. And I have to admit, I used to think that. It's just why are these people buying these pixelated images of cats and things? But it's it's you you did a really great job of explaining like it's not it, it's much more than that. It's these rules behind it and you can uh, give people access and then you can change that over time and that blows my mind i think this is this is so interesting and exciting and small businesses can, can use that as well which is which is great so how would you how would how would a company a small business who loves the they might be listening in today how would they go about doing that they, they've got a really good idea but it just seems a bit too complicated yeah, of course. And yeah, at first they 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 need help. Like uh, first they need to understand the idea, and then they need yeah. a way to put this NFT out there. There are a couple of platforms that exist that make it easy for you, but then still it's best to to talk to someone that has already yeah. done it. Now that's what I'm trying to do with my masterminds. And there are people in there that are entrepreneurs that have a business but want to use web3 so they come in my mastermind because it's more interesting for them to discuss with peers like also we do in the rice community and 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 that i help them instead of hiring a, a, an expensive agency because if you are a business owner you just want to you know get your stuff done or the alternative is of course that you that you yeah try to understand that you take a course that you try to understand everything and apply it yourself um, the thing I would say is just don't make it too complex. Start with a simple yeah. idea. Try to see how you could do it. Try to see, can you do it yourself? Do you know someone that can help you? Can you join a community where people doing are doing it? Or like, you know, do you want to, to join a mastermind? Just see for yourself what, what fits for you. But I would first try to understand it myself and see how you could do it before you, you know, you delegate it. Definitely. So I think you've 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 kind of answered part of my next question, which was common mistakes that businesses make, and maybe one of them is overcomplicating it, trying to do it themselves. Are there any other common mistakes in the Web three world that you see businesses making? Well, yeah. So thinking that Web three is indeed only like a JPEG, or, or or it's easy, or there are Web three is like the real world. There are also scams. There are people. With, you know that try to that try to to hack you or whatever so you need to, the same thing that in web 2 you should be careful if you get an email or someone on social media approaches you that you don't know you should also be careful in web 3 don't click on on a link or if you don't so that that's one thing you should be be careful because it's not because it's web 3 that that it can be both ways it's not worse than in real life or in, in web two, but it, it's not better either. So just be be aware of that. And then uh, yeah, and, and if you start with something, just yeah, uh, think it over, but don't think it too too much. Just make something yeah. where you know that the risk is limited, and try it. Because if you wait too long, you will you know you will. And and if, and if you have your, yourself an NFT project, that's what I learned. Just first NFT, give it away for free to people, so that the friction is. There is no friction because you just give it away. If you ask people to buy it, even with their credit card, they they maybe you know are not feeling really comfortable with it because it's something they don't know. But if you give it to them, then they get to learn it, then they get to know it, and maybe they will come back. So that's also an advice that I would give. And if you make it like really complex, if you want to have an NFT with a lot of utilities, they call that a lot of value services linked to that maybe it's good to talk to a lawyer or someone who really understands what you are doing absolutely well another mistake uh, that you could make is not to buy the book and read uh, yuri's chapter on web3 uh, so chapter 31 how to use web3 nfts and tokens for your marketing so definitely check it out it's an amazing chapter thank you yuri for for that and we're almost uh, almost out of time. It's just gone so quickly. I know you had this experience earlier, didn't you? <laughs> yes. It, you know. Um, so here is here is the book, the QR code. And this will take you to Amazon. Uh, we've had quite a few more clicks or, or uh, QR code scans, which is exciting. So if you've just joined 
and you don't know what this is about, we have, uh, so Mark Schaefer has put this book together, collaborated with 36 authors. Yuri has written the chapter on Web3. I've written the chapter on live streaming and uh, we're trying to get through uh, interview as many of the authors in the book over the 24 hours. So if you scan that book, the most marketing, the most amazing marketing book ever, I should say, uh, it is on special offer on Amazon. Uh, the Kindle version is only $2.99, which is a bit of a steal. So that is that is awesome. Well, thank you, Yuri. It's been great to great to have you on the on the show. Uh, I probably will be seeing you in Newcastle. Um, yeah, which is you great. will. If you will be there, uh, we will see each other. Great. So it'll be great to to see you in person. Well, thank you, Yuri. Uh, I will put you back in the green room. And uh, thanks. I'll, no problem. Well, uh, I can see Scott. Uh, Scott Murray is, is in the green room. He's been very patient waiting for his slot. Uh, but uh, just a reminder uh, of the the book. Uh, this is this this whole live stream is this is part two of the twenty four hours of amazing marketing ideas. There are six streams we're going to be going on for four more streams after this. Um, we've got speakers and hosts from all around the world. Uh, Mark Schaefer is going to be on in a bit too, which is very exciting. Um, so do check that out. The Instant Replay Hub is definitely worth looking at. If you can't stay up for the whole event, if you can't stay up for 24 hours, I'll, I'll, I'll let you off. But you can scan this QR code and get access to all the videos, the replay uh, with the Instant Replay Hub. So do scan that. That'd be cool. Um, and of course, you can buy the book. It is out today. The book book is out and also the Kindle book. The Kindle version is on a special offer at the moment for $2.99. It's only like that, for I think, for the next week. So do be quick. Um, but enough of me gibbering. It is time to bring in my final guest of this segment for uh, for part two. And that is, let's get it on the screen, Scott Murray. And I don't think Scott and I have not actually had the pleasure of talking yet. So I'm excited to meet him. Uh, Scott has written a chapter on ch chapter four, consumer behavior arriving in a new marketing era. And Scott is uh, otherwise known as the communication craftsman, combines over 20 years of content marketing experience and extensive communication education to help companies build better connections with their most important audiences. Let's bring in Scott onto the show. Scott, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? It is good to connect um, finally and might as well be on a live stream podcast. What better way? <laughs> know, well, it's very typical uh, marketing thing. We don't we don't meet people in real life, but that's we, right. We, we meet them on a live stream. Um, <laughs> we will find a way. <laughs> we'll find a way. Well, yeah, now that we're uh, now that we're kind of going out uh, to to events again, uh, hopefully mm. I I need to I am coming to the US later this year. I'm going to Boston uh, to be at a oh. conference, but yeah, I, I miss I miss all the travel and, and meeting people and the yeah. connections. But the Rise community is is fantastic, isn't it? Even though we yeah. don't always speak face to face, we've got so many conversations going in in that in that community, haven't we? Uh, which is which is great. So I'd I'd yeah. love to know, uh, Scott, how did you get to be involved in this kind of mad uh project <laughs> of the book uh which is is quite a big a, a big thing to get involved with first of all have you had experience writing books before uh was this your first experience or uh, and maybe tell us a little about how you got how you got started with it yeah it is my first um involvement in uh working on a book or being published in this way. Um, and it, it's good timing because this was right around the time where I was already thinking about looking into that. I had attended some uh, sessions at marketing conferences and things um, uh, about going the book route. It is something that um, I still want to do um, uh, past this. Um, but this was a great first step and a great experience to learn so much, but also, you know, this is that, as you're just pointing out, I mean, it's one thing to have a chance to read a book. It's an, or to write a book. It's a whole nother thing to be able to have the opportunity to collaborate with so many other really, um, insightful people and say that you were a part of something like that. So, um, it's really an honor for me because I've been, um, in marketing for, um, like, 
like you mentioned, for quite some time. And uh, for, I'd say, just a little bit over the last 10 years, I've been following uh, Mark's great work. So um, when he launched his uh, personal branding masterclass, uh, that was right around the time I was going out on my own. So I said, well, how would I not want to do that? So uh, <laughs> I got involved in that, which gave me an opportunity not only to learn a little bit about that, but also meet him for the first time uh, and talk about what I was doing. And th there's some parallels in our interests as, as far as it relates to marketing and being human focused and people focused. So there's some really good synergy there. And um, yeah, it was just really great to get to know him over the last year. And when this project came up, um, you know, it would have been kind of challenging to write about the importance of communication and marketing. I think that's the other project I've, <laughs> that I was mentioning that I'm thinking about. I mean, I don't know if you could fit that into one chapter. <laughs> so Mark was like, well, hey, how about consumer behavior? Would you be comfortable with that? And I said, yeah, because that's the other side of the equation. Those are the people that are making the demands of yeah. what they want to hear and what they want to get from you from a communication and messaging standpoint. And it also allows people to have an opportunity to see kind of how they're shaping uh, that in our industry. So it still fit into uh, my expertise, and I'm glad we were able to figure out a way to kind of hone in on a very important part of that equation, because I think it will complement really well all the other great advice that's being shared in the book. Because if you have an idea of kind of how consumers are driving things today, it'll really help you apply a lot of the other things you're you're seeing in the book. Definitely. And, you know, we, we, we're all experts in our field but we can't be experts at the same level in everything and that's what this book right. kind of does it, it just yeah. it's so detailed i mean, I think part of the problem is um, and, and you kind of alluded to this is it's really difficult to kind of concentrate all of the all of what we know into just one chapter and 10 points yeah. as well uh, i was also like it's it, your experience as well it, i think one of the one of the really cool statistics about the book i think i'm right in saying that if you combine all of our marketing experience, it adds up to like 750 years or something. Mad. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I think you've contributed quite a lot to that big number <laughs> with your 20, uh, is it 20 years, 25 years, whatever it was. Yeah. And what's funny is, you know, so much about what I talk about involves just how things have changed and how things have yeah. evolved. Um, and I, I can say that I've witnessed a lot of that just in the 20 years that I've been doing this. Um, I mean, I was the last person in my, uh, um, college class in 1998 when I was getting my bachelor's uh, in, in video production that was still doing analog video editing. And then my first couple of jobs were still in print where we were still writing ads for newspapers and magazines and doing audio advertising in the phone book and how I've had to kind of evolve what I yeah. what I knew into things like digital marketing, social media, blogging, podcasting and everything today. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's an example of just um, how much has changed and how much continues to change. That's the thing. It hasn't slowed down at all. So right. it's uh, probably sped up thing. quite a bit. Yes, it, it has. <laughs> I mean, you do, yeah, I suppose you don't really want to have a job in the world of marketing if, if you like the world to stand still you know no it's, you're not going to be a very happy person <laughs> a great way to put it <laughs> <laughs> well if you've just joined us uh or if you've been watching for a while we'd love to hear from you do uh, do comment if you've got any questions for scott or for myself do put them in there don't be shy uh but i'm gonna ask scott uh, scott tell us a little bit more about your chapter so it's entitled this is chapter four uh, I, I bought the Kindle version this morning. I've ordered the book book. I can't mm -hmm. wait. It's going to arrive on yep. Friday. Um, but your chapter, chapter four, consumer behavior arriving in a new marketing era. Can you give us a brief overview of the key takeaways from, from the chapter? Yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, I was talking about how I've had to evolve and keep tabs on things. And that, that even includes um, learning from experts, a lot like the people that uh, we have in this book. And I remember when I was doing some research um, and doing some coursework, even through Coursera, um, Northwestern University was putting out these great modules on what's happening in digital marketing. And the key takeaway there, uh, back when I was first getting kind of introduced to these trends, was marketers are no longer in control of what's happening out there. The consumers are now in control of what's happening out there. And part of it, you know, you see that in how they block, ignore things, they can scroll past things. If it doesn't resonate, they move on, go look somewhere else. 
And um, the idea is, you know, I kind of opened the chapter with something that I thought Brafton did a great job of explaining, which is kind of breaking it into eras. So um, they said that, you know, the 80s and 90s, back when marketers could rely on captive audiences and radio and television to just, you know, spam whatever they're telling you or communicate one way to you and just hope that you remember next time you're at the store to go buy something or pick up the phone and call. Uh, That was called the marketing era. They literally just called that the marketing era. Ads could do the talking for them. But now they've kind of framed our modern era as the relationship era because now consumers are in control and they don't want that one-way communication anymore. They want to be involved in the dialogue and they want proof that you're really in it to serve them. So I I think that's a really good place to start uh, when you're developing a marketing strategy today. And I think what the chapter does is it gives you some really good examples of just how consumers are driving that change and how they're kind of gatekeepers into what they're going to engage with, what they're going to listen to, how they're going to respond, but also how they're taking things that we once almost held dear as the rules of marketing and consumers are like, yeah, forget that, do this (laughs) instead. And I think it really helps people get a better understanding of just how much they're driving everything in the marketing space and how as marketers, we have to be willing Mm -hmm. to evolve and engage in ways that they want us to. I think we've heard this before. We've talked, we hear about humanized messaging and humanized marketing, but I think a good starting point is really getting a chance to look here and see just exactly what that means by some of their behaviors and some of the things that are happening out there. Really fascinating. Yeah. So I, I suppose for businesses who know they need to change, but are maybe are a bit reluctant, part of that shift has to be a mindset shift, I, I, would, just, I would say. Mm. And part of it needs to be education they need they need to kind of learn more but i it strikes me that part of it is just the ability to listen to your customers how 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 is the best way to do that i mean in some ways it seems simple just listen to what your customers are saying but have you got any any thoughts on that of how different businesses can actually listen to the messages that their audience and their customers are saying, because how can you change your marketing if you don't, aren't listening to them? I mean, I actually uh, had a chance to talk with Frank and Marcy recently about um, uh, their chapter on marketing research. And we talked about how that can kind of cross over in ways to engage with your audience through email, uh, social media, especially. I mean, when you think about how many companies are utilizing social media as a rotating billboard to promote, Mm. I mean, that's the very thing that, you know, we all see every day and it's easy to ignore. But once you start seeing people out there finding ways to ask questions, whether it's polls or questions or conversations they're having on social media, there's a lot of ways to get insight there. Developing a more community-focused uh, marketing plan, which Mark talks about in his new book about community marketing and belonging to the brand. There's opportunities there for not only for you to have conversations with your consumers, but they can also have an active role in what's happening with your products and services. Um, I used to work for a company that regularly um, would hold uh, digital events and live events, and they always had surveys where they were asking people questions about um, not only what was being shared, but what they were concerned about and things like that. And you can build off of that. I also think it's really important that sales and marketing talk to one another um, because I've seen situations where marketing thinks this is what people want and sales says, that's not what we're hearing. (laughs) So uh, that's uh, also, I think, a really important element of getting to know um, your consumers, but you know, a big part of marketing sometimes too, is just testing different things. And if you're, you're trying to find new ways to, uh, engage with them, communicate with them and you try this and you get a little bit of a response, but you try this and it really, really works. It can really kind of start the foundation for evolving into more, a, into more of a humanized, uh, marketing strategy, but also now suddenly your consumers realize, you know, that you're doing more than just out there selling. Yeah. That's so important. Really, really helpful. So what you, you've obviously had this long career. You 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 tell, told us about what you were, um, you know, you could have 
with analog video and, and <laughs> ads and phone books and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and now we're in this world, you know, we've I've just we've just interviewed Yuri talking about Web3 and NFTs and all this kind of stuff. You know, it'd be kind of interesting to go back into a t- time machine and tell the old you about all of this stuff. And Totally. But, <laughs> totally how, true how so what i so the question i have is well, what is the most impactful experience in the marketing field you think over the last 20 years and how has that shaped your approach so it doesn't have to be a new thing it could be something back 20 years or but what what's been the maybe the most impactful experience i think when i got the opportunity in 2007 to come in and completely completely change all aspects of strategy, messaging, and content for on-air fundraising drives uh, for the Dallas-Fort Worth NPR affiliate, public radio affiliate. You know, it was a situation, you want to talk about something where people hear the same things all the time. Strategies tend to be the same, even in different markets. But we're having an issue here because it's taking too long to raise the money. We're getting complaint calls from listeners for interrupting their programming and, quote, begging for money. Um, so I came in there and had a lot of, um, success there. By the time we had changed everything, we were setting fundraising, um, records, um, positive feedback from, uh, the listeners about a fundraising drive of all things. Um, and it just came down to creating content that was going to engage them, resonate them and talk to them on air in different ways that didn't sound like begging or didn't sound like what they've always heard. And also really made people feel good about uh, donating and giving um, because, you know, that that was always the barrier, right? Especially yeah. if they were hearing these things all the time. And I've noticed that um, in the last 10 or 13 years, as um, humanized marketing has become such a big thing, and I look at the things that consumers want, there's so much crossover there. You know, there's barriers on the consumer side, too, because they're already skeptical about this. It's probably clickbait or this is just going to trap me into giving my information or they're not really going to provide value. They're just trying to get me to buy something, you know, and we have to reframe things and recommunicate things to make them think differently, break down those barriers, generate emotions, make them feel good about not only what they're about to buy or who they're connecting with, but also make them feel good about that purchase or that engagement weeks later. And there's a lot of crossover in the changes that I had to make there uh, that I'm now working with companies on evolving on their content and messaging um, just because, you know, very much like, you know, donors are kind of in control whether they give or not. Consumers are in control of what they're um, going to buy and engage with um, on the digital marketing front. So, um, it was a really, it was a really good opportunity because, you know, when you're in the nonprofit space and it's all about donating, there's a lot of emotion and thought that goes into that process. And that's what's going on out there today. So that was a really good primer for what a big part of my career was going to become after that. That's cool. So uh, Frank uh, is saying, we love the synergy between our chapter and Scott's, uh, which is cool. Uh, it just shows you yeah, the, the the beauty of working with others in a community. Uh, and Sandy, uh, this is interesting because I wanted to follow a question. He said, just Sandy says, uh, a humanized marketing experience is important today more than ever. And you know what I'm gonna ask you, you know, everyone's talking about AI and uh, how how does, you know, this humanized approach, you could argue it seems at loggerheads with the AI approach. No, I, 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 I don't think that's the case, but how, how how does that play in? How can how can brands remain human and have a human faced approach and adopt AI? Can you help us navigate this world? <laughs> yeah, I well, I mean, I think the key with AI is, um, I mean, first off, I mean, there's still lots to learn, um, and um, I think it, it's kind of ironic how, as we talk about it in the humanized context. Uh, that one of the key things um, I've been talking about before AI became what it you know really is uh, today as far as a hot topic is not being over-reliant on technology <laughs> to a fault. <Yeah. laughs> you know, so it's like, that's why you see so many great experts on LinkedIn saying things like, don't use AI to just write your blog post or write your web content or do everything for you while you sit back and say, all right, done, you know, uh, and... A part of that is because I think, you know, there's there's a lot um, 
that we can still offer that are that are just unique as human beings. And I think we still have to have that. I think AI can help us kind of frame it or make us uh, or help us understand how maybe a direction to go or how deep to go. Um, but I still think that brand voice, um, that proof that we are human and we are wanting to make a human connection with the people we're trying to help um, is really important. And I think people are still working on ways for even when you talk about things like chatbots to come up with experiences that at least feel, if not human, then a genuine attempt to help somebody else and not just a trap to route them to a, a cell, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think that's uh, that's kind of important in the grand scheme of things. So um, I think just like automated social media, there's there's a place for it. You can use it, but an over reliant over reliance on it work against you and your competition may notice that. And if they're the ones that start to engage more on the human level, um, getting those people back after you lost them would be very difficult. So I think there has to be a balance. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, it's, it's AI is here to stay. I think it's something that we should be using, but I, I, I agree with you on the whole content creation thing. I'm using AI to help me with ideas for blog posts and maybe mm -hmm. structure but I'm not comfortable in getting it to write the whole thing. I just, I, I just don't think that that's useful. Although, or, or I don't think that's authentic. I don't think that's being human. And but sometimes I will use AI to kind of go over a paragraph and maybe simplify it and come up with ideas. So sure. maybe that's the way to use AI. And and it's obviously something that we have to keep our eyes open um, and 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 monitor. So I so that kind of brings me on to the next question, which is. How do, how do we as business owners, as marketers, and uh, I think the majority of people watching today live are watching the replay in the future or reading the book or listening to the book indeed uh, are going to be business owners and marketers. How do, how do we stay ahead? Because as you said, marketing is changing. It's changing more rapidly than ever. How, how do you stay ahead and get... Um, ahead of the curve and, and know, know what's happening. I have just done everything I can to keep tabs on how quickly things change. Um, you know, I, I never, I never think that I've, I've figured it all out. <laughs> uh, I feel comfortable about enough of what I know to be able to help, but the only way I can continue to do that, you know, what I'm, how I'm helping people today might be completely different three or four years ago. There's probably going to be some things that are the same, but who knows what will change. And I just need to keep tabs on that. But I've done, I mean, even just in the last few years, I've, I've tried to do a lot more um, to you know, gain insight that will help me help others. I mean, that really is what drives me. I mean, even, even in the days when I was working at that station, we had a conference every year uh, to learn strategies and things. And then when I would try something, the station would work. The first thing I'd want to do is go to that conference and help other stations learn what I figured out to help them out. So, um, I mean, in, in recent years, I've uh, I've gotten better about finding more time to read. There's so much good, uh, so many good books out there. Uh, but there's also um, really good thought leadership on LinkedIn. Um, and even though I had I, I got my bachelor's in 98 and I'd been doing those um, courses on uh, Coursera, I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to take everything that I know and everything that I'm seeing and uh, try to reinforce it uh, in another way. So in the last year, um, I went online and got a master's degree with a focus on um, uh, professional communication. So we're talking about communication in the areas of marketing, PR, crisis communication, social media, things like that. And that was a that was great because it it did one of two things. It reinforced some things that you know kind of validated what I was seeing, but also um, showed me just how many other areas that the things that I'm learning are are applied. Uh, like I didn't realize the crossover of humanized communication, knowing the audience, how much that also applied to things like crisis communications, uh, for example, and how, you know, view of the of the response and the, the preparation internally is is uh, very similar to some of the things I talk about just with straight up marketing. Um, but the other thing that was really fascinating about it, you know, I was just talking about books and thought leadership and you know videos that we can find there's also some pretty deep academic studies out there that you can find i know it's it, they're sometimes tough to read because they're 
<clears throat> written in a very academic language, but there's some stuff that's been written in the last few years where people are studying, where these academics are studying these changes about how consumers are wanting um, brands to communicate with them, what feels like real communication, what feels like real humanity, uh, what they're going to ignore and what they're going to um, uh, engage with and and really deep specifics on the philosophy behind that and what's happening. I didn't realize those were out there. I thought they were, you know, academic studies were for other academic things, but they're out there. And that really provided a lot of extra depth to um, my background. And, and it really helps me provide a lot more, um, uh, a lot more specifics and insights when uh, talking with uh, clients and companies about what's happening out there. That's really interesting. You've you've got me thinking there that I should probably be looking out there seeking these these texts. It sounds a little bit scary. It but, is at times. <laughs> but you know, so Mark, Mark is here and says, Mark Schaefer, he says, Rise Community has be become my university. It's how I stay on top of things. And I suppose like if you are reading one of those academic texts and there's something yeah. that you don't understand it's great to go back to the rise community you know and and someone once said I, I don't know who it was said if you are the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room mm, and i, like I feel in in the rise community i feel like i'm just a, it's just surrounded by incredibly smart people and i can yeah. and learn so much and i think the other thing i find about the rise community you, you think if I'm around so many smart people, I would I would feel really well stupid and and maybe maybe that there's like I, I'm going to ask a silly question, but everyone's so everyone's really caring and and wanting to everyone's wanting to learn together, and I think everyone is yes everyone knows that we're all still learning because I think that's somebody somebody else said once said that you know if you once you stop learning you you, you may as well give up yeah so I think that's really really helpful. So we're almost out of time, Scott. I just wanted to, for, for new business owners uh, or new marketers, I suppose I should say, uh, what are the essential skills that you believe are necessary for marketers to succeed in today's wild world? <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I, I would say that if when it relates to really making that first step to evolving to be a lot more consumer focused um something i often say is one of the best things you can do is stop thinking like a marketer <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one, yeah. <laughs> uh, and because you know that doesn't mean stop doing what you do well mm -hmm. it just means that you know the the fundamental definition of marketing has has terminology in it like selling and promoting yeah and that can't be really uh, our central focus anymore. That goes back to something that worked during that captive audience, one-way communication thing. Um, so now um, it's really important to get in the shoes of your consumer and start trying to, I would just say, um, spark something, you know, spark a reaction, spark a relationship, spark engagement. So you can almost be, instead of marketing, you're a sparketer um, instead of a marketer. Um, and I think that's really uh, a, a really good place to uh, to start because what ends up happening is we we sometimes get so we talked about automation even people can become automated mm -hmm. and we get stuck in in traditional marketing strategies that might have worked well a few years ago that don't work really well now or rules that we used to follow that consumers are saying we don't care about those rules um, and a lot of times because we get in that marketing mindset. Um, we'll create content sometimes that if we were to go home and see it ourselves as a consumer, we wouldn't engage with in a million years. <laughs> yeah. So I think the important thing is to remember that not only are you a marketer, you're a consumer and to start yes. thinking more of your behaviors as a consumer, you can really probably start some pretty big changes, um, in the ways that you're going to be able to communicate and resonate with your, um, most vital, uh, audiences. And um, I think that's a really good place to start because you know why you ignore things. You know, you know, the barriers you put up when you're looking at advertising. Start there and then kind of um, shape that to fit the people in your industry as you get to know them. Love that. And I love, yeah, we, we all love Sparketer. That's that's great. Uh, <laughs> Sparketer instead of marketer. Love that. Scott says Sandy and Frank as well saying Sparketer. That's genius. Yeah, it's great. We, we'd love to say this is why everyone's going to have to 
get the the recordings of this uh so you can get that in the hub i'll share the the, the qr code in a minute and why you should buy the book as well um so who else beyond oh so this is uh valentina saying i feel like i'm growing because of the rise community in a friendly way and i think yeah that's it it's, it's friendly yeah uh it's you don't feel like there's such a thing as a silly question uh because we're all learning together that's uh, right totally so uh thank you scott it's been great i'm just getting up the caption for you for the the book the, to remind you. us of the chapter that you wrote chapter four consumer behavior arriving in a new marketing era you can get the kindle book you can get the book straight away instantly mm -hmm. downloadable if you go to this qr code scan it uh, or just go to amazon and search for the most amazing marketing book ever. The Kindle book is just $2.99, a special deal for the next week. And of course, you can buy the book book as well. It's been a fun project, hasn't it, Scott? It's been exciting. It really has. It's been an honor to be a part of it. And like you said, uh, to be a part of a community that is um, so collaborative and so insightful at the same time and feels kind of like a, a family of marketers that are <clears throat> trying to help each other help others. That's It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> well absolutely yeah i mean it's yeah I, it's quite i actually have to say i got quite emotional today when well the other day when mark said it had you know been launched and this big project and we've all been part of it together it's it's been just such a fun collaborative experience so uh thank you for being part of it sure my pleasure thank you uh for the opportunity to come and uh, talk about it with you today Awesome. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, it's been great, great to finally meet you. Uh, hopefully, you we can meet in person uh, someday in the near future. Um, yeah. But I, I will let you go back and get on with the rest of your day. All right. Thank you so much, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take. Care. Awesome. Well, we are almost at the end of this part two. Don't worry, it's carrying on. It is twenty four hours after all of exciting marketing experience. There is the Kindle book. Uh, you can scan the QR code. I can see a few more scans, which is exciting. Um, but let's look at, see who the, the next guest is. Now, my next guest, uh, unfortunately can't be with us in person, but uh, she has recorded a video. Um, it's, and let me just get the QR, not the QR code. So it's been, it's getting, getting, uh, towards the end of my, my brain starting to go to mush, but it is the wonderful Mandy Edwards and her chapter, chapter 15 is for the love of Facebook, Facebook marketing. Uh, so uh, now Mandy is the owner of Me Marketing Services, a digital marketing company based in Statesboro, Georgia, a wife, a mom, and 20 plus year marketing pro. She loves helping businesses find their place online. Mandy was unable to attend live today, but she has sent the, sent a, a video. Uh, so Lou, I'm going to play that video for you. Uh, but do stay around for, uh, I'll just say a few other things at the end. So here's Mandy's video. Hi, I'm Mandy Edwards of Emmy Marketing Services, and I'm the author of Chapter 15 for the Love of Facebook. I'm very excited to be a part of the most amazing marketing event. I've been working in marketing since the days when people still bought ads in the newspaper and Facebook and social media as we know it didn't even exist. I spent the last 12 years working with small and medium-sized businesses, helping them find their place online through social media and the web. My heart is truly in serving and helping others, and I love what I do. I commonly joke that I would do it for free, except I have two teenage daughters. I've loved being a part of this book project because I've been able to meet so many wonderful people who are thought leaders and experts in their field. Some of them I already knew, but many of them I did not. There is so much experience and knowledge within this group of authors, and that's what really makes this book special. I don't think there's another book out there like it. But I wanted to give you a couple of Facebook marketing tips uh, to help you be successful in your Facebook marketing efforts. And I can't wait for you to get your copy of the book to read all of the Facebook tips I wrote. Tip number one, be yourself. Be authentic. People can spot fakes and sales pitches a mile away. Um, and especially Gen Z, they have been able to spot inauthentic content quicker than really any of us. Two, understand your audience. Discover who they are and create relevant content around them. I commonly talk to clients when we're in the process of, you know, discovering who their audience is. I ask them to make sure who is that perfect client or customer to walk in the door. 
You know, who are they? What are their interests? What are their demographics? There's a lot of assuming, but you have to go through that process to discover who you're going to target and what kind of content you're going to develop for them. And three, don't be scared of Facebook ads. I know there's a lot of stigma and a lot of misconceptions around it, especially over the last four or five years, but there's still a lot of opportunity for you to find the audience that you need to reach through Facebook ads. Some do have some limitations um, depending on the industry, but every business has an opportunity with Facebook ads. I know you're going to enjoy this book and all of the knowledge that is in it. Uh, you will get so many tips and have so much, you know, behind you that's going to help you be successful. So you can go ahead and go on Amazon and grab your copy. I hope you enjoy it. Have a great day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mandy. It's great that you were able to do that video. <clears throat> and uh, we are at the end of part two, but don't worry, there's going to be lots of other cool, exciting things coming up. If you uh, want to get the replay of this, if you want to get the, the videos, just scan the QR code on the screen uh, and you can get access to the Instant Replay Hub and you can sign up with your email. We'll just keep you up to date with what's happening in the, the book world. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for joining us today for the 24-hour Amazing Marketing Live Ideas show. This has been part two. My name's Ian Anderson Gray, and it's been a pleasure to host you today. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining in. And of course, if you are watching the replays, I hope you've really enjoyed it so far. I also want to thank the, the guests uh, that I've had on this part. It's been great to meet you all. I think you've all done fantastic. Uh, and of course... You can, um, let me go the right way. It's this way, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. I, I need to put my finger the right way. I need to remind you that you can buy the Kindle version of the most amazing marketing book ever at a, limit, a special price of $2.99. We'd love if you could leave a review on Amazon. All you need to do is just scan the QR code. That should send you to the correct Amazon for you. But of course, you can also just search for the most amazing marketing book ever as well. <clears throat> so that would be that would be really awesome. So stay tuned. Oh, by the way, yeah, if if um you want to find out if you want the actual link for the hub, it's bit.ly or bit uh, l ly forward slash 24 hours amazing marketing. But do stay tuned because uh next up we've got some more fabulous authors and we've also got uh, the host of fabulous host Kami Hoizu, uh, who is absolutely been integral, who's been central at organizing us all uh, with the promotional side of things. So thank you, Kami, for all your amazing work. It's been uh, fantastic. Uh, so there we go. Yes, um, beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, engagement, is that Valentina? I I, can't, I get confused. Uh, it is Valentina. Mandy is dropping great tips, totally. And also the page is playing the, so Cammy says also the page will be displaying the current live stream, which starts at 11 Central Zone. And thank you, Valentina. Uh, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. That is it uh, until, so do stay tuned. We'll have uh, the next, next one coming up, but I will see you very, very soon. Toodaloo.